set up to just do more stuff like what we just did and what we're about to do um and it be at a neutral location and you, yeah you know what i'm saying like here like and i uh, i don't care with really anybody coming to my house but um man if i've had like a th- i've had about a hundred podcasts wow so if i have okay. like that's like a thousand people over time coming to my house it's just, it, i'll still have probably a recording space here but probably do it mostly i have recording space at the uh Morlton in my office too I wow do some okay i didn't know that for you audio there had a office all the way over there you're everywhere dude i know <laughs> it's not it's not all, it's not all it's cracked up to be so well uh, i'll give you a little introduction here uh so uh life unraveled with uh Mr. Thurman Storing, uh, recent, I guess, have you grad, you haven't graduated? Uh, well, uh, the formalities aren't finished yet. I mean, it's like where, where you have to go through the whole assembly line routine. Whatever. Yes. And it's like, yeah, shake your hand, you know, uh, whatever, go do whatever now. But yeah, I mean, I mean, technically, yeah, I, I, I have earned the degree. The thesis defense is over. The thesis is written. So it's, it's done now. And yeah. And of course we can talk about other things as well, but that's yeah. what I really want to talk to you about is your master's thesis. Right. Congrats on that. Well, I got to you. go watch it, told my classes about it. Oh, cool. Um, I have a couple of students that are going to end up going to tech. We, uh, we, everybody that comes to Moralton transfers out. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's sort of like a Clarksville situation then, right? Where it's <laughs> like everybody, everybody somehow ends up at tech unless they're like, uber intelligent (laughs) yeah 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 (laughs) well see this is a a unique situation is what we see is we see kids a getting associate's degrees before they graduate high school or as they graduate high school i didn't even know that was possible that's a thing you know i mean wow i'm showing my age at this point you know i I, I, I didn't even know that was even possible so well they had i feel like just started letting high school students take like comp and college algebra when i was going and right uh, i think they had been doing it for a few years but it definitely wasn't something they were knocking down my door to the right, yeah, I yeah, wanted yeah. to be a part of. Yeah, why why didn't I get the memo? You know, right. It's like it's like yeah, yeah that that could have saved like a lot of grief, you know? <laughs> well, and then this, so like students that like myself, I had a two point nine in mm-hmm. high school. Not a good GPA. It was not yeah, good yeah. at math and science yeah. at all. I mean, I'm season D's. Hey, uh, I, I hear you, man. I, I was I was right there too. You yeah. know, I mean so so it's it's good to know that, you know, there's there's another uh sort of yeah it, exceptionally intelligent person who didn't apply themselves either you know when they were in school and they just kind of slacked off right yeah and now society calls us intellectuals right. yeah you know right yeah it's like uh, uh yeah I, I wish i'd been probably a more diligent student back then but it's like hey man i spent uh, i don't know how many countless hours staring up at my ceiling like listening to albums you know thinking about how life's gonna be you know and i wouldn't trade that for the world me either <laughs> man me either that you have to do that uh you know i didn't really get any of my shit together so like 23 years old i dropped out of college multiple times hey yeah um i hear you didn't know what i wanted to do when i even when i first decided like, oh, i'm gonna get my history i wasn't confident yeah. and i tell my students this all the time because they don't know what they want to do <laughs> but students can go to this community college get uh, be a shining student right. at a community college when they would be like not marketable going into a four year institution. Yeah. So these students are graduating uh, high school with not good GPAs, go, coming to community college, and then they get scholarships going to universities. And, or, like I was talking to this one girl today who's about to graduate and going to do history, and she got a four year plan, but it's like two years for her um, bachelor's and then two years for her master's that's right. what she's planning on doing and uh she's like 19 years old has <laughs> has one more year at Moralton, and i'm like man you're like why didn't i have my shit together like you <laughs> 19 year old student from dover yeah i i don't know man i, I don't know but yeah uh yeah i i, I feel you you know i mean i dropped out for a long time too so and and sometimes it really surprises. when did you get your bachelor's when did i get my bachelor's i gra- i finally graduated in the year 2016 Okay. okay. So, so I finally earned that, that uh, even though I had gone off to school for the first time in 2003, you know, so it's is like, that Is that when you graduated high school? Yeah, I graduated in 03. Yeah, we were talking, because I think I'm, uh, well, I guess, oh, I guess I was thinking it was 04 when we met, but it may have been like 02. Yeah, it may, right, because if, if, if you remember me where I went through that, Spiky, Horrible. spiky blonde yeah, hair, dude. You know, well, I mean, I guess everybody has to start some, you know, or go through these phases or whatever, right? Where, yeah, I was bleaching my hair. I, I wore the Hawaiian shirts and stuff like that, and uh, yeah, that was a really, really bad fashion faux pas. But uh, you know, you know, but yeah, yeah, that was that was like O2 me. It was like like by the time I got to my senior year, 
I was pretty much this. You know, I have probably not changed the style. Dude, that, that watch band. Oh was yeah, legit. yeah, yeah. This this is uh, actually you can buy this at JC Penny. But uh, it's a it's a Casio watch, and I loved it because it it looked deliciously retro. It looked like something right out of the 1980s. Casio, all yeah, the way. man. It's like it's like yeah. This is uh, this is like uh, a Gordon Gecko Wall Street, you know stuff. <laughs> it's <laughs> if I was gonna, I don't wear, I don't really wear a wristwatch very much. Yeah. But if I was, it would be like it would be that yeah, band, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it would probably be a Casio. I had like a. Um, for a while i did wear a watch um but it's like for the gym i take it off all the time so i'll probably go like a smart watch if i go yeah uh, if i decide but man i don't think i'm gonna because i did do, doing jujitsu <laughs> like i would forget to take it off periodically and people would grab my wrist and stuff yeah. and it's just it's a it's a pain same thing with the wedding <laughs> ring man like I, i'm always afraid i'm gonna like get my finger pulled off doing yeah jiu-jitsu. yeah 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 well i mean like sure never happen yeah i mean fine barely even no, fits I me saw this saw this pictures point. of it on instagram happening to people it would oh, never happen to me wow. <laughs> but yeah i need to get one of the i have those silicone rings but yeah yeah i mean I, I use a sizer on mine you know I'll, I'll leave them sitting there and the dogs will eat them you know yeah. i don't leave this one laying around for the same reason yeah but. i mean when, when i got married uh this this actually fit me but i weighed like 230 pounds at that point so wow yeah i was i was pretty big no but, way yeah so but now i I'm didn't like see you then back to a robust like 160 so you know, yeah yeah so so doing good <laughs> nice dude um so you went straight through from your bachelor's to your, to your graduate yeah uh i waited like a semester and, i had and, i had something like that i had to yeah, get a surgery yeah oh, when, when really? i was in i had a hernia repair so oh. i ended up taking i actually was i had the surgery while a semester was going on yeah uh and i finished that semester and then i took the next one off right just recovered and but uh i went back and everybody i remember at the time was like don't don't stop you never come back (laughs) right yeah yeah and i was like hey uh i'm I'm back (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah i mean like uh yeah i i just i just took like one semester off and and to me it was totally totally worth it to do that because yeah you kind of gauge your options on what you what you're gonna do right at that point it also gave me plenty of time to work on music and stuff like that so i was like yes you know that's great Dude, I, I like seeing you post those videos oh, man thanks. Uh, i appreciate it I, I i've shared a few videos myself just being inspired like you and other people my friends list doing it i'm like man i, I like doing it because like i started videoing myself and then i would um listen to it in my car yeah yeah on my way and i would be like oh, no one changed something like, you right, know, like yeah, the original yeah. jams yeah. and stuff and i was just like I, I was getting the footage on my phone though but man with phones nowadays and <laughs> that like the storage on my phone is like like my computer size hard drive in 2012 you know yeah, like yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. i think it's i have a 256 gig iphone i had 200 videos on it the other day right and I'm like, never could I, I used to have to like delete it after 20 small clips. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. One, one of the things that I've realized too, with, with uh, sort of like music production now, I guess you can call it is, is that, man, I wish like when we were like teenagers that we'd had YouTube, you know? Oh, I know. Cause it's like back then it was like so hard to get your, your music out there or anything like that. I mean, we were still like in the age of CDs at that point, you know, every, we weren't, weren't even to fully digital. We format. were still downloading from Kazaa right, yeah, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. LimeWire. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many funny memes about like all the, all the P, uh, P2P yeah, sharing. Yeah. Uh, iMesh, BearShare was oh, another yeah. one. Uh, yeah, bear sheriff. Yeah, my parents' <laughs> computers so bad. I, I know, remember. It's like you, you, you think you're you're downloading. Yeah, like hey, uh, I'm downloading the new Perfect Circle song. You know, and it's like nope, that's not what it is at all. You know, it's some some Trojan virus or something that yeah just tears your your hard drive apart yeah. do, you, do you remember tim peterson yeah i hadn't thought yeah. about that dude in a while yeah um he had like the most insane digital music collection really ever yeah he like one time one time like i had like maybe a hard drive there with my like we were in the uh auditorium right and he was like he had his computer there with this his stuff on it i was just like dude like all i do is download music and your collection is blowing me away man but yeah that was that i would say that was like probably the focus of of like my junior high and high school years was download those songs and like then i remember after high school getting out and downloading on a platform like at an apartment i lived yeah 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 and they shut my internet off. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's caught up. Yeah, right. Yeah, the, the gig's up at this point. You but know, by that like, time, you could right. listen to stuff on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, so. right. 
But yeah, to, to have a platform like YouTube, and I mean, there I know there's so many channels and so many people out there doing, but just just the accessibility of it is extremely nice. And I mean, you can go with YouTube or you can go with, uh, um, trying to think what the name of the, uh, SoundCloud. SoundCloud, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, or, or that. Dylan has an awesome SoundCloud. You know, it's, about but it, right? it's like, man, if I were, you know, when, when I started playing guitar or whatever, when I was like 15, 16 years old, it's like, wow, I wish I really could have had that, you know, instead of recording to a cassette. You know, it's mm-hmm. <laughs> well, even even this, even loopers, man. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I, I don't know how long loopers have been around. Like I just started charting them in the last few years, but I just did. Uh, I'd borrowed one from Dylan, and like I was like, okay, loopers are cool. I need yeah. one eventually, and then I just picked one up when I was getting a lot of those boss pedals. And that's a game changer too, because I will either I'll I'll set a loop and I will it's helped me get better at playing lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I like I wouldn't have you or somebody here to play along with. Right, right. Um, and if you're learning to play lead, like like I've been just like doing scale drills. Uh, yeah, like yeah. G, G major is the scale I'm working on <laughs> right. all the way down the neck. And um, but that uh, it's having the looper has been great for yeah. just moving and patterns. Uh, yeah but uh that's been a game changer but yeah you you know like where i'm learning the scales watching youtube videos right. dude yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's another thing too right is 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 that yeah there's a lot of instructional videos out there about right how to improve your techniques and all that but it's like yeah we did we had a book you know that's pretty much what it was or you had a book of scales or whatever that you had to learn or right it was through playing with other people that was like the only way you could sort of progress unless you were like i guess uh a virtuoso you know and 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 just had it in you you know man there for there was a period like a couple years ago where i was like the digital age has only brought shit <laughs> you know like honestly it's only yeah. it, it, like i can only see the negatives and then i like as i started working uh as a professor i was yeah. like I was using technology more and I was able to sit like, and I was getting like, I have about 550 YouTube videos on our gym channel. Okay. And then this yeah. is about a yeah. hundred on my podcast channel. Okay. So just like I've started, like started engaging more on different mediums and stuff. And it's, yeah. um, but it's been, uh, like I would say, like man, YouTube, like you can slow things down or speed them up. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That's an awesome feature right. that like, right. is That's... stock on all players. I have premium too. Yeah, that has some nice benefits. Um, but I listen basically if I'm in my car driving to work, which is about 25 minutes. I'm learning. I'm listening. Right. Yeah. Um, you could do that anywhere you go podcasting i mean you know like yeah. that's what got me interested in doing it other, other than just creating but right. like i listen to podcasts all the time you know do you listen to any podcasts uh no actually i don't are so you, so this this is kind of like a like like new territory to you me, are you the know? podcast yeah i know it's kind of weird i make I, jokes about that all the time because like <laughs> uh i was like yeah i used to think about you know college in the way that you guys do and now i'm giving you this test right yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's kind of weird man honestly to be the administrator of the the class right yeah i mean I, i've been working as a teaching assistant so it's like yeah i, I, did I, that. I really get that you know i really understand that are you are you going to adjunct what are you what are your plans i don't know yet i'm not entirely hey sure. i didn't have plans you for know? four years right it's great. Know, i'm not i'm not entirely sure on uh one thing that i mean i want to do is i want to eventually try to get this thesis published i want to do that be and well i mean eventually i want to go on and get my doctorate but nice. you know, it's like, well, we're we're having the baby like in two weeks. So, oh, dude, yeah. I didn't know it was that yep. close. Or yeah, I actually, close. I actually probably wouldn't ask you to come on the podcast, man. Oh no, I mean, because I was it's, like, it's, it's I, all good. It's all I good. thought about, you know? uh, I was like, man, I hope uh, Thurman's wife is healthy and stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah, today, yeah. and yeah. he's not like, oh, I'm, the, you know, no, 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 no. She, she's I, fine. Yeah. We just went to the doctor. Everything, everything is good. Uh, the, the it's it's not to the point yet. I mean, do you know that? Do you know if it's a boy or a girl? It's a girl. All right. Yeah. So you, it, you have a name? Yeah. It's uh, it's going to be Luna Renee. Luna. Okay. Yeah. You told yeah. me. You told me this at the because uh, Luna's yeah, okay. a guitar. But I looked at a Luna mandolin recently. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. yeah see, because I, I ran across. Uh, uh, we were up in in Fayetteville, and there's a there's a music shop up there called Arkansas Music Works. It's really cool, and and they had like Luna brand guitars there, and they had one that had like Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night on it. So I'm wow. like, I like to, I'm like telling Terry uh, that my wife, I'm telling her, I'm like, yeah, we should get that. You know, we should we should get that for Luna because it's got her name on it, and you know, it's Vincent Van Gogh. So you know? I, I played with a guy <laughs> that played with the Luna. Um, 
And I could have got that Washburn mandolin in there or the Luna, yeah, and I was yeah, for the yeah, same yeah. price. And I was like, "Give me the Washburn." Oh, okay. I was like, well, I don't really yeah, know yeah, which one's yeah, better, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I was like, and then too, the Luna was black, and that Washburn was sunburst. Right. And I wanted more of a sunburst. Why? Well, right. I mean, that's like, like I, we were kind of talking about this earlier with with guitar brands and all that. Yeah, just right. Go what feels good with you. You know, it doesn't matter if it says Fender or Gibson or whatever. Uh, on prefer, the, yeah, yeah, on the headstock, you know, or you know, just. Yeah, if if it speaks to you, then go for it. I know? got I got onto that where like I started picking up on how uh, guitar players are commenting on woods. Oh yeah, tone woods and stuff like. It, is that what you're talking? It, well, about? of like, hey, this wood, this of this tree that this neck is made out of in Japan, it feels great. Okay, okay. Uh, or <laughs> yeah. um, just certain type uh, different tops on uh, acoustic guitars. Oh like yeah, yeah. Koa, yeah. Uh, different spruce yeah right uh, but i started but that was one thing a but woods from asia <laughs> seemed to be hot amongst guitar players right. for a neck yeah and i was like well that's interesting because jimmy herring from uh panic and he does solo stuff too it's one of his posters yeah. up there um he's just like you know this is just a super cheap japanese strap man <laughs> and it's like my favorite it's like this this neck it's great and and, yeah. and he's just like he's like it was like no money but he's like this neck so then i was like i I was like well maybe if you know made in japan guitars are all have this society you know i've just been yeah kind of uh that's one of the things like i've been paying attention like is this guitar i'm looking at made in japan and a lot of the mustangs and and guitars of the off shape are i've been noticing uh in korea i've been seeing some that are made in korea right and a a lot of uh especially if you buy like offset stuff you find out a lot of them's like uh uh basswood basswood however, however yeah, you say it yeah. you know? and it's like which is lighter gauge wood but it's like yeah being a guitar player and like really getting into like the gear aspect and all that it's like man i didn't know that there were like 400 different types of rosewood you know i didn't know that you well know? and then too like i was mostly an acoustic player for years so like that's been me with pickups right and and oh, yeah. and, and uh-huh. effects and amps and pedals too because um i really when i was growing up and playing i had mostly multi-effects right and i kind of got away from that entirely yeah uh, i i did too i i had like this vox tone lab thing it even had like a vacuum like valve tube in it yeah i guess powered the preamp section on it or whatever but yeah i mean that's what i started with but yeah then it's now i just use individual effects you know individual effects pedals and uh i don't know that just uh seems to work out better for for me i I guess it's because you're not having to like menu dive or go through a bunch of like knobs and stuff you can just flick one you know on and, and you're good you know this is something i've been playing with is like uh running like dirty and clean channels Oh. And having one set of uh, one chain of pedals on one speaker and a different chain of pedals on another. Okay, speaker. well that's that's pretty cool. That's know? I've noticed a couple of guitar players are like way better than me. Uh, <laughs> Adam Jones from Tool, he does that, but he has this Boss switcher. Yeah, uh, that um, powers one chain, and then he so that way. Um, you don't have to, if you ever watch tool play live, Adam Jones, isn't just like married to his pedals. You know, he's not having to stand there all right, the time. Right, He'll yeah. get really far away from him. But I think it's cause he's like, this is, he has them set up. Like I'm doing songs one and two here. I need right. to do a change on song two right. for the course. So I need to stand there, but he has to do a minimal. And I've noticed that playing with that many effect pedals. Yeah. Uh, it's like, Oh man, I want to play this song now. Right. Yeah. I need a yeah and it, even if it's just between song they turn this one off turn this one this one on this one goes off and this one goes on yeah uh well i mean have you you've heard of the uh the genre of shoegaze before no no you've never heard of shoegaze no shoegaze was like a a, a popular kind of like indie rock movement it started over in england in like the the late 80s where it was just like wall of noise, just crazy. Just like if you ever heard uh, My Bloody Valentine or Ride or, uh, uh, gosh, uh, there are several uh, popular shoegaze bands from that time period. But um, they, they were named shoegaze because, I mean, not, I mean they played insanely loud, but they were, na- they were called shoegaze because... Uh, the guitarists constantly had to stare down at their shoes at the ground because they were flipping through effects pedals 
the whole time that they were up there on stage. That's, that's funny. That's, that's, that's where funny. that's where that comes from, or, or or that's that's the legend of where where the term shoegaze or where, where the label for this music came from. I, I'm from a shoegazer guitar. right yeah, now, dude. Right, yeah, I don't. You know? I, I'm trying to figure out ways around it. That's yeah. like that's why I was. Uh, but so I was like, why? What? Do I, what did be these guitar players mean when they say like uh, they would say wet and dry? And I was like, what? So yeah, I started figuring out, like, yeah. they would run like this. He would have one cab for when he's playing clean, and he might add a volume pedal on that. or, And that's why I was noticing, like, why do these guitar players have two volume pedals? Yeah. Like, so I noticed that on this Jimmy Harry and, and Mikey Hauser, for example. A lot of times they would have one, a volume pedal on their clean channel and a volume pedal on their... Yeah. Uh, but that Hauser guy I was telling you about, Ed Mattel, he's modeled after him. He would ride that volume pedal while he was solo. And it gives it such a unique sound. Yeah. And Jimmy Herring does, he used a volume pedal too, and he has to play, like Hauser died of pancreatic cancer in wow. 02. And that's why a lot of people don't really, and Panic went through this period where they didn't have guitar players. Yeah. It was as good as Jimmy played for the dead. He played with Bob Weir. He played for the Allman Brothers for a year. Yeah. So with Warren Haynes and uh, Trucks, and he played with, uh, have you ever heard of Colonel Bruce Hampton? No. You might like Colonel Bruce. Colonel um, Bruce. He yeah. passed away at his 70th birthday party, jamming with the Tedeschi Trucks Band, Widespread yeah. Panic. John Popper from Blues Travelers yeah, just yeah. killing it on a harmonica solo, and he died. Like, they're all jamming wow. at this dude's 70th birthday party, Fox Theater in Atlanta. It's on YouTube. And, uh, the, yeah, what a way to go, though. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I got to shake that guy's hand on my honeymoon in Mexico because we saw Panic play. Yeah. And uh, he was at the airport, and I was like, hey, thanks for sitting in last <laughs> night. It was awesome. <laughs> like, and he was just like, you're, you, but this guy, Colonel Bruce, is in the movie Sling Blade. Okay. Yeah, right? right? He's the he's the old man, uh, the band leader or whatever, the mustache, okay. the older guy. Uh, and then there's a guy in a wheelchair. That guy's also an incredible musician, Vic Chestnut. Okay. Yeah. See, I haven't seen Sling Blade probably like in 20 years. I got to rewatch it because yeah. I teach Arkansas history now, and I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a way to work it so in, dude. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> we did. We watched uh, A Painted House. Have you ever read that book? Uh, I actually have it. It's it's on my coffee table. It was recommended to me, and it's just set there because I've been dealing with uh, all this research stuff. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, hey, recreational reading. You know, that sounds great. But it's like getting back to that point is 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 kind of hard. But yeah, I mean, I have the book. It will be read at some point. So yeah, man, uh, it's it's good. The movie's good too. Excuse me. The movie's good too. Um, I didn't know there was a movie. Yeah, it's got um, uh, Neil from Dead Poet Society, okay. uh, that actor. <laughs> That's all I can tell people. Uh, he's also <laughs> Dr. House's best friend on right. House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's in it, and um, it's actually got uh, a few people that grew up to be famous. Um, I never really w- watched a lot of The Walking Dead, but Maggie, the actor in The Walking Dead, um, she's in it way yeah. younger. Uh, and then also, um, I didn't. I watched a couple of seasons of that Orange is the New Black when okay. it first came out, but there's a guy in there they call um, uh, Porn Stash. <laughs> <laughs> and he is an actor. He, I've also seen him on like Law & Order SVU. Yeah. I don't even know yeah. his name, but he's in a lot of different movies. And he, he's in that. And there's like all these younger actors and older ones too. Yeah. Um, but it's got it's just, it was like a Hallmark movie or something but <laughs> it's good I mean John Grisham from Arkansas and it's right. about the Arkansas Delta sharecropping yeah so right so do you, do you work uh, work that into Arkansas history then? yeah okay yeah. Uh, in, in well, that, okay then, then that makes perfect sense then to add Billy Bob Thornton why not you yeah know? So let's just, be proud of our heritage right exactly right? well yeah <laughs> I sh- uh, we were talking about um, do you remember this political ad that we, so we just did Huckabee like we did Clinton Huckabee uh, all the way through Asa Hutchinson okay uh, we just finished up yeah like, just test review today but we're talking about uh, during the um, Going into the 2016 elections or uh, the presidential race, like 2015, Mike Huckabee comes out with this political ad and he's like standing um, in this like out in the snow and with a trench coat on like this. And he's just like, there's a cemetery behind him. And he's like, I always knew that if I was running for office against a Clinton, I had to beat the voters in the cemetery. Wow. And I'm just like, 
Uh, well, you know, I've seen atomic bombs explode uh, yeah. in the background. Sh- of shots these. fired. Yeah, yeah I, but it was. It very much was. And I want to say Sarah Huckabee Sanders, or what, is, is that her last name? Uh, his yeah, daughter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, is in Russellville maybe today? It's uh, it's tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, it's in Witherspoon Hall, too. Oh, which, wow. Which I I didn't know about until this week. I'm like, wow, this is going on, like, right in the building where I'm at, you know? I'm like, great. It's like $50 to get in. I heard that, yeah. One of my you know, students like, was telling me today. I think that's a little steep. She you know? may um, be, I, this is a rumor, but she may be running for governor. Yeah, I've heard that too. Uh, I mean, with the name, the Huck, Huckabee name. The Huckster. Yeah, yeah. You know, her dad slapped the mean bass guitar. Yeah, yeah. I've, se- I've seen him play before and I was impressed. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was too. Okay, I want to say that he's played with like corn or something before. Like played with like uh, Brian, I, I, Brian I Welch. I hope so. I, because I, of his, yeah. Yeah, the, I, I really certainly hope that ha- yeah, Like, Like that is like, that is a way to win votes right there you know i mean i mean i remembered it yeah um, right I, I definitely don't i don't lean republican oh nor am i super liberal but i'm right i'm just kind of in the middle man hey me too man most yeah. most people i meet are most people i meet are pretty like just dis- you know well unless the you, whole thing unless you go on the internet and then it's just like no holds barred like like i mean they're like so such extremes that it's it's just like it's so crazy you know it's social just, media has become yeah. a weird place you know man. see we were talking about right like the benefits of technology it's like can we really say that this is a benefit at this point you know i mean i know man uh did you see the hysteria just here locally this week about the sex trafficking that's not what they concluded uh, was this with the uh, uh zip ties thing is, it, is that what this is mm, i don't know some guy named six on a bicycle and there was oh, a van okay, and okay, all this okay stuff. yeah no see because i i see several things right you know so you're just going through like your facebook feed or whatever and you just got stuff popping it yeah this is because uh i, I want to say there was an email sent out about it mm. maybe from maybe public tech, safety yeah, yeah. The tech public safety sent out an email Email. yeah i remember seeing that and and uh, yeah i mean it's yeah it's weird you know well that's been a major uh in the just in the zeitgeist is the yeah uh, sex trafficking right it, it, that it's going on in every state that it, it's going on all around you that it's going on in russellville right and i'm like man i you know and this is i've said this a lot over the last couple of years in your thesis defense which I, we can start talking yeah, about it. Yeah, it kind of curtails got, into got this, me. Yeah, it? like yeah. I, I feel like we are in a third red scare period. Yeah, okay, right. You know, like, and, and too, like, that's like your, your, your thesis is th- super thought provoking in that regard. Cause, like, did, did you get my message about son in law the other day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I could kill Kennedy. But, you know, <laughs> I, I caught myself after your thesis defense being like, somebody asked me some question about like, we're doing history of Christianity. Like, why are the why are the gospels written in Greek, you know, not Aramaic? I was like, it's a conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, but you know, that is become very much like so many people I know have dis uh, distrust in our government. Yeah. On a even even on the like, I'm sure you may be cute in like locally in Russellville, everybody right. hates the government. Like yeah. uh, myself included. Uh for <laughs> for like we've we've had issues with our own pro- commercial property yeah. and they rezoned our lot twice. Yeah. Without telling us illegally, but it's it, the, the, no, I don't really know anybody that you know was like, yeah, man, the government they've got our best interest. Right, the police, everything, right. just just follow along. We're right. good. We're, but nobody's really saying that. And so, like, what? Go ahead and kind of. Get, what's your thesis all about, man? Like, we haven't really we've been danced around a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, I'm I'm just gonna with your. Uh, your uh, disdain of government, right? Uh, hashtag taxation is theft, right? We can we'll that, I that saw out. those. I got a meme yeah. on my phone. Yeah, I, I just like, screenshot like, it yesterday. Yeah, you see that all over the place now, and and it's hilarious. But um, <clears throat> my thesis, okay. I mean, I wrote I wrote a thesis entitled um, "In Search of Veritas: Kennedy Assassination Conspiracy Theories and the Emergence of an American Culture of Suspicion." Uh, 1963 to 1993 and it's uh mainly about it it links the kennedy assassination particularly the kennedy assassination conspiracy theories with uh, this sort of reflection of growing distrust in american institutions in american government even uh, it even goes to like the news media just this complete kind of abandonment of uh any type of credibility that people have in their government and that the 
uh, emergence of the Kennedy assassination narrative mirrors how Americans felt about American institutions at that time period. So, for example, uh, and this is this is one thing that I always uh, enjoy bringing up that kind of like turns people's heads is that even though it, the initial weekend when Kennedy was assassinated and even a few weeks after that, two thirds of people believe that it was most likely, hey, there could have been a conspiracy or whatever. By the time that the Warren Commission issues their explanation that Lee Harvey Oswald had shot the president, he was by himself. You know, there was no conspiracy. This is in September 64. There is a Harris poll that comes out in December of 64 that shows that 86 to 87 percent of the American population now believe that Oswald had acted alone. They're completely satisfied with the Warren Commission report. And what's your what, what sense do you make of that is that people still did have faith in their institutions and their government at that point that uh, that the Kennedy assassination as an event didn't necessarily shatter people's preconceptions on how they felt about their government at that point. However, by 1966, after you have the initiation of, say, the Vietnam War, or you have uh, economic problems, you've got uh, Lyndon Johnson's uh, policies are failing at this great point. Society. Right, the Great Society, right, the, the war on poverty and all that, it's, it's failing at this point, right? And uh, you've also got uh, uh, immense, like, racial inequality at this point too so there's there's a lot happening both internationally and domestically civil rights yeah. right yeah civil rights act was that 65 yeah that was in 65 right but in 66 you had the watts riots right so uh, yeah. 68 i've got been playing in a big series of podcasts well, about 68 i mean i can help oh, you with that the whole want. year damn <laughs> yeah we should yeah because that's should. kind of viewed as right like the year that like the the, the dream broke, died man. yeah yeah you know it's like yeah <laughs> that's a there's a book that that's the, the this yeah it gives yeah, year by yeah, year yeah. breakdown it's called the year the dream died. yeah yeah, but the uh, but by sixty six that number has 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 changed again. And no longer do you have eighty six percent of people believing the Warren Commission believing that uh, Oswald had acted alone. Now it's two thirds. It's back to two thirds again, right? And and as it progresses, as you get more stuff added on to this, as you get things like Watergate or the release of the Pentagon Papers or the uh, Rockefeller uh, Commission or or the the Church Committee that you, that finds that the the CIA are up to no good. Or that the FBI is spying on people, then suddenly you got nearly nine out of ten people now believe it's a conspiracy at this point. It's just uh, it's a it's a mania. It's a paranoia. What is the Jack Ruby narrative in the '60s? Like where where what's the thought? It's like uh, initially was that like oh yes, uh, the, Jack Ruby did us a favor by killing that man that killed the president. Yeah, I mean, there were people who reacted that way to when it happened, right? That, that yeah, they were acting, you know, yeah, hey, hey, you know, they shot that, you know, SOB Oswald, you know, who had, who had killed Kennedy or whatever like that. So yeah, right, there there were people who who kind of in a way viewed him as a hero, right? Yeah. But um, it, I would I would say you know that that Ruby really doesn't become um, like 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 a major part of the narrative. Until you get sort of these uh, the the emergence of of the mob being involved, the mafia. Yeah. You know? Okay. So did you watch? This is great. Great timing on this. I'm gonna triple check my card didn't fill up. I don't think it did. But the Irishman. Have you seen that? Uh, no, I have okay. not. Oh, hold on, just a second. Okay. They, they say the mob. Okay. <laughs> oh, person. Okay. okay. Keep clicking there. I meant to clean. I meant to delete. That's a 128 gig uh, card, and I meant to. Okay. Uh, I've done. It. I can do several podcasts. I have to delete, but sorry, oh. sorry, sorry for breaking the. No, 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 no. That, no that, that's fine. I, I've I've not seen the Irishman, but I I have heard about it uh, because it's based on a book, right? It's yeah. It's called like you you paint houses or yes yes right yeah that's that's what it's based on and 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 it sort of follows this. Uh, uh, what what would be like the common mafia kind of narrative? Well, in, they in say the in this film, spoiler alert, they say <laughs> the mob killed Hoffa and the mob killed Kennedy. Right. That is the, right. they say that and they say, they say it kind of passingly on the Kennedy thing. Right. But uh, I'm just like, man, that's, that was bold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, it is one of the narratives. Right. At least. right. Like, when did that come into it? It, it is it is a popular theory, and I mean it's one that has existed since the '60s. 
but uh, the the popular narrative now is more that it was like a a joint venture between uh, certain rogue elements of the CIA and uh, the mafia conspired both, right? That they're working together because they're both angry about, well, the CIA is angry about the fact that uh, Kennedy kind of just left him twisted in the wind with the Bay of Pigs thing, right? And and also uh, the mafia is upset because they got kicked out of Cuba whenever Fidel Castro took over. So, you know, they don't no longer have this enormous gambling franchise anymore. So that they kind of hooked up in order to, uh, yeah, uh, eliminate Kennedy, right? Well, what was uh, the potential? Uh, I guess they were trying to link that with uh, Kennedy's dad, right? It was like Kennedy's dad that had the mafia ties. Is that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard this, too. I mean, I don't really know that much about Joseph Kennedy's ties to the mafia. But me I either. have heard that, you know, it's like, it's like you hear these faint whispers about stuff or whatever. And that's kind of what formulates conspiracy theories in a way, right? It's, yeah. Is that, but... Well, there was conspiracies right, was like boot, about him being Catholic and all I, sorts of yeah, things. Yeah, I, I think it was bootlegging, right? Is I think where, where Joe Kennedy kind of gets in on. Where, where, where yeah. Yeah, that would, that would line up. Right. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, the prohibition thing mm-hmm. and all that, right? And, and um, yeah, I think that that's where that comes from, right? But the popular kind of uh, narrative is that the CIA and the mafia are both running guns to Cuba uh, there are like three distinct areas like uh, Miami is controlled by the Traficante family. Chicago is um, uh, I want to say that was uh, Giancana and then New Orleans is Carlos Marcello who uh, I mean Ruby is connected to Chicago and then he, I guess he has some connection to New Orleans somehow but um, but yeah that 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 these groups, banded together in order to eliminate Kennedy could in order to achieve their ends or, you know, whatever. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. I mean, when it's, you know, Scorsese, obviously, I bet he's talked to a ton of people and, and had some confidence in that theory. I mean, I know that Scorsese just doesn't put out like historically, you know, and and I don't think that's his purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, um, uh, I mean about that, I mean, allegedly there are informants who supposedly claim that that uh, Carlos Marcello said that, yeah, hey, we we did this, you know, I had Kennedy knocked off or whatever. But it's like, you know, it's never been proven. It's like, well, you're getting this information from insiders who are criminals themselves, and it's like, can you necessarily believe what they're saying? What are they trying to get out of this? You know, but I mean, like, like this is this is based on. Uh, th- th- there are people who, who claim that, yeah, that Marcello kind of fessed up to it. And in the 70s, uh, there was the House Select Committee on Assassinations, which studied both the assassinations of President John F. Kennedy and of um, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? And and they found that uh, they felt that Carlos Marcello had the, the modes, uh, the motives of opportunity in order to do this. And, and that they felt that most likely the mafia were the ones responsible. In fact, the House Select Committee went against the Warren Commission and um, declared that a conspiracy had occurred in the Kennedy assassination, that there was a second shooter. What about the RFK assassination? You know, uh, have you done... Because well, this RF, is like RFK thing, yeah. a pinch, uh, uh, apparently had pissed off the mafia right uh, right in uh, what was it in Chi- where was it chicago or well, yeah. where was he trying to clean up at i well, can't I, that, that had to do with also I, I yeah that's like the whole hoffa teamsters union thing too is isn't that yes in that. that is why hoffa yeah. ended up going to oh okay yeah right <laughs> but Man. yeah yeah allegedly right that that uh rfk uh right robert kennedy right had had upset the mob because yeah he was busting them up breaking up the teamsters unions you know that sort of thing but also i mean there's the the debate that yeah, okay well maybe it wasn't mafia maybe it was like cia because uh, robert kennedy was an opponent to the vietnam war or whatever and it's like uh, the military yeah. industrial complex or whatever you want to call it have you heard this conspiracy about the there being an earlier draft of that eisenhower speech from like 54 i think or something uh, where it says a military industrial congressional Combo. No, I hadn't heard about that. No. Well, I, so like I heard about they were talking about it on Joe Rogan or some other podcast, and I was like, 
and they were speaking on it like it was authority, but then I right. went to researching it, and there's all this debate. Like they they have a speech that was a month earlier, and yeah. it didn't say congressional in it. <laughs> but um, people try. I mean, I'm like, well, he didn't say congressional, right? Well, I it, it, like like that. That makes me think that there's there's like a, a national security directive that's often cited by. Uh, well, Kennedy now, I would say, uh, President John F. Kennedy, the president, President Kennedy, has kind of this this this. Uh, I don't, uh, people kind of view him as, as as like this this peacemaker guy now, right? He's not a cold warrior, right? Even though, I mean, if you look at the history, he was. He's a martyr. He's he's, yeah. he's he was the the slain knight of Camelot, right? right. You know, or, there, there's like a national security directive that that Kennedy issued where he's like, hey, I'm going to pull. 1,000 of like these advisors or whatever out of Vietnam, you know, and, and, and oftentimes conspiracy theorists or even historians will look at it and be like, hey, this is where this is Kennedy saying we don't belong in Vietnam. You know, this is like kind of the withdrawal thing. Right. But it's not necessarily that way because it's like he was just he wasn't calling troops or anything out. They were like construction workers. Right. Yes, you know, yes. they, they, they weren't like like necessarily like needed personnel and and kennedy had only done this because he felt or from his advisors uh from the joint chiefs of staff that the war was going better that it was going in a positive direction at this point so of course if the war is going in a positive direction you're going to move your resources to somewhere else right this isn't just him saying well i'm like morally opposed to the vietnam war or you know what whatever like that but after Kennedy dies, I think it's like within four days after Kennedy dies, uh, Lyndon Johnson is then president. And he issues a directive that pretty much reverses everything that had been done, you know, kind of before that. And, and a lot of conspiracy theories are, well, this is the start of the Vietnam War. We're going to need more you know, bullets. Right? Yeah, you know, that sort of thing, you know. But it's like, if, if you look, there's actually a draft that exists of pretty much this same document that was drawn up during when Kennedy was, was still alive. You know, and, and it's just pretty much Johnson is following the Kennedy directive. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of interesting like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so a couple other things. And, like, w- what I liked about your thesis is because, like, why, like I, did, I, I saw you put that video out and you said the title and I was like, <laughs> whoa. Yeah, yeah. Like that, okay. Like, I get, but, like, I knew that you were interested in um, just, like, Kennedy stuff. I think we had talked about it previously. Yeah. Um, but like your take on the thesis of like the it introducing this uh, culture of suspicion, everything and it not just being like about, well, Kennedy ordered, you know, uh, ZM to be assassinated. Right. And, yeah, and yeah. that's why he got us, you know, yeah, or the yeah, mob yeah. or like, I know you talk about that stuff, but yeah, that's it's, not right. it's not like, no, it's not the focus. Right. It's not which is cool. Right. Like, and they they brought that up in your defense. And I like I thought that was because they told me the same thing. They're like, don't write your thesis over something that's already been. done. Yeah. Yeah. And they said, you kind of can. But like what they said with you, don't do it on your dissertation. But this right. definitely has legs because, man, like what I forget which professor is saying, but this this, this kind of ties into like the the nine eleven and the yeah, Vegas yeah, right, shooting, right. and that, you can even say the Jeffrey Epstein thing now, right? Yes. You know, it's like yeah, you can even tie it in with that if you wanted to. But right, everything in a way kind of has its roots, or as as far as is as we understand the modern conspiracy theory, has its roots in the Kennedy assassination. Like I argue in this paper too that like the Kennedy assassination. Uh, essentially changed the definition of what a conspiracy theory was or is and and that kennedy assassination theory conspiracy theories they, they aren't just like like i mean in a way people do treat, treat them kind of like as as a parlor game or whatever but they're direct attacks on authority you're saying that your government is wrong that your government lied to you and that your government may have had their hands you know in in what happened in in november on november 22nd 1963 you know and, and that that the Kennedy assassination theories helped weaponize this in order, and it, it took, um, yeah, the credibility away from from the government that way. So it's 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 kind of like it's activism, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, in a very okay, because that, okay, that's the thing is that's what you, we demand that. That's yeah, like uh, I, th- I think that's part of the civic experience is that we, but ah uh, man, when there's all this suspicion so all <laughs> right. this all this shadiness and um but what do you, so on the couple of the conspiracy theories i've heard about like just in that same time period of of zm and johnson i i, I feel like those are two that i i feel like they're heavily gone into as a matter of fact what's his name who's the trump backer he just got convicted of something um 
he was he did a documentary. He was in a documentary about Trump when Trump was running for office. Yeah. This guy was involved in the Watergate stuff. And yeah. He's been back. He was a big Nixon supporter. I forget his name. Roger something. Yeah. I know what you're talking about, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, but like that uh that guy's been a rogue element of this of this whole narrative like he he, he was he was going he wrote this big book that just and it came out some within the last few years it's like yeah johnson did it here's all the connections here's the story the guy that owned the book place is you know connected to johnson's his lawyer yeah. and all this stuff and i'm just like i remember like i went down this guy's thesis and watch some documentaries next thing i know i'm texting jeff woods being like dude lbj do you think he killed kennedy <laughs> like man tell me what do you think yeah, yeah and he's like okay what have you been doing yeah right i was just like nothing i was just doing some 68 research and i just you know <laughs> like rfk got me going down this rabbit right. hole and you LBJ killed them both. And I was just like, I mean, uh, I don't know, man. But like, that was a convincing, I went like a, a, a pretty deep rabbit hole on the Johnson right. thesis. And I've heard that like, oh, okay, well, that was retaliation for Kennedy popping ZM. Like, what do you know yeah. about either one of those theories? Well, uh, the as far as the Johnson did it theory, that has actually been around for pretty much as long as the assassin because it right you know you look around and you're like well who benefited the most right from this and it's like well he got the presidency out of it you know yeah we know johnson was a very very vain guy right so it's like you know you he could, wanted all of his relatives to have the same initials as yeah him. you know so it's like yeah okay i can kind of see that you know happening but like uh um uh as as like like what what you're kind of getting into here and it's 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 what i really you know like like to stress with 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 this this thesis is that conspiracy theories speak to people they provide explanations to people especially when an official version an objective version of the truth or whatever appears to be cold or irrational or or it's it it doesn't jive with people you know and that conspiracy theorists or people don't believe necessarily conspiracy theories because of the conspiracy theorists or necessarily because of the theories. It's because of the, the atmosphere. It's because of the, um, the environment. It's because of what's happening sort of around at this, this time period. And that conspiracy theorists, they're essentially for the most, and I'm speaking from the Kennedy assassination here are for the most part, their research can be extremely shoddy you know they can be extremely extremely terrible researchers just as bad as as the people who who they're railing against you know they're they're even poor historians at times right but they're excellent storytellers right because they explain sort of they offer a seemingly tangible explanation for why we ended up at this point in in time when it's that's point, their right? conviction right yeah you know yeah. They, that's like how, how like when people get into this uh like there's a jujitsu guy for example that is a he's a big time flat earther <laughs> yeah. that, eddie bravo is yeah, his yeah, name yeah, and yeah. he's kind of okay. famous like i mean he's like jujitsu royalty so to speak we did a podcast about him on sunday like uh, we just like watched a couple of his famous matches and talked yeah, about him. yeah but it's like that dude just like watched a doc and he is a conspiracy theorist on all sorts of shit man right but um he also comes across as absolutely batshit crazy <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah and that's kind of like uh i feel like a lot of times um that's what you run into is you run right. into like it, it's not a real right credible historian doing the work and and maybe when you do that work you get what you right. come out with which is a uh, like you just kept talking about sort of objective versus relative truth and all this right too. right and, and i i think another important thing to emphasize here is that while i say that like you know maybe their research wasn't exactly great or they were yeah pretty terrible with uh yeah with with the research or historian aspect of it is that sort of that first initial wave of conspiracy theorists that emerged after the warren commission report came out were actually respectable and credible people like, I mean, they, they weren't just like what we would describe today as your average run of the mill tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist. You know, these were respectable people. Eddie like, Bravo has a podcast called Tinfoil Hat. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> like that's the enough, full, you know I mean? full circle on that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I mean, they're out there. Right. So it, it did help that um, 
that the initial wave of researchers who argue, hey, you know, the single bullet theory is ridiculous. You got this bullet zigzagging all over the place. Or you have these eyewitnesses who claim that they saw um, or they, they heard shots come from the grassy knoll or whatever. And, you know, you had people who were like uh, you had uh, college professors. You had um, uh, lawyers. Mark Lane uh, was an attorney. He wrote uh, Rush to Judgment, which was like the first conspiracy bestseller in 1966. The guy was like all over the media, all over the radio. I think it been like 2,000 publications on this. Yeah, topic. I mean, it's one of the most written about subjects, if not the most written about 20th century American subject, right? The Kennedy assassination. And uh, do you think these early researchers uh, just do you think they came out with what they came out with working off a of limited detail? Like we kind of talked about that or I kind of was like, hey, yeah. where's the digital age and all this? Is it right. helping our interpretation of this or is it making us more like, look at a, I can consume all of it? Yeah. You know, and yeah. is, or is it making us more confused? I would say definitely more confused. One thing about the early researchers is that they were all pretty much unified in sort of their vision on what what they felt had happened or who they felt well, uh, it was it's, it's more about activism at this or it's more about pr- like what, social justice. Yeah, right. You know, because it's still at that time it's a current event, right? It's and it has some relevancy to kind of what's going on during this this time because it's 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 immediate, you know? You're you're feeling the repercussions of it of the event itself at this point. So, right, it's 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 about right, justice at this point. But as the narrative continues to add on all kinds of of, of different aspects of how society feels about their government, about suspicion and distrust. Does it get turned into this, this, it's almost like modern American mythology where you have a battle of good versus evil of individual versus the government or Dude, versus society. You're giving society. me goosebumps over here. You know, and, and I'm it's getting excited. <laughs> like literally well, you did it like, well, but it is, it, but it is that dichotomy. Right. And I mean, people like Alex Jones, not to get conspiratorial, but like, I right. mean, he is all, talks about that. Oh, this, I've heard him on Joe Rogan's podcast say this. Um, the CIA and you know, there's forces of good and there's forces of evil and the CIA. And, yeah, and yeah, at the last yeah. possible moment, the forces of good always come in and win. And uh, but he's like he talks about that about right. there being these two. And you uh, you talked about it being uh, sort of like what people refer to as the deep state. Yeah, yeah, right. That there's this invisible hand that is just like like controlling everything and that's unseen. It's like right. It's 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 a like behind the curtain there's another curtain and behind that there's another curtain you know and you don't know what's even beyond that you know and yeah but yeah that that there's right this fear that and and right this does tie into kind of your red scare thing too right there's this fear that there are unseen things going on right it ties into russian collusion yeah yeah you you can even uh, i mean you mentioned the thing with the sex trafficking deal right it's like pedophilia satanic panic right or for the 1980s you can get into like that sort of thing yeah uh, what do you know about uh like do you ever get into any of like the bohemian grove stuff like in that the moloch potential moloch worshiping cult in the united states uh no no it's also connected to into that yeah (laughs) So there's this place called Bohemian Grove outside of San Francisco, and there's this gigantic owl. Okay. And they have this play where they do these rituals and do this effigy sort of sacrifice like like they like paddle in and they like give them give them this thing to sacrifice i've heard about this but i didn't know the specifics of it and it's like one of those things too where it's just like okay if if you're you're a person who has a lot of money and probably a lot of time on on your hands you know you're probably just gonna screw with people you know it's right yeah but that was one thing i was like man there is all this weird sort of uh shadowy satanist occult uh pedophile yeah, yeah. rings and pizza gate and well, okay yeah i remember the pizza and, gate and, and like yeah. people have tried to kind of tie all of this together of like right. these are all the same people right and uh but it's just like that's the that's the spirit of the times or the uh yeah the uh collective memory right I, this is where we're at. It's yeah. weird yeah i i think another important emphasis with the the kennedy assassination thing is is that it sees also uh like a reversal in a way of what americans feared it because like you mentioned the red scare right i mean but that's an external threat right 
the Kennedy assassination makes it an internal threat. We're fearing each other. We're fearing ourselves. You know, we're fearing our very government, you know, Mm -hmm. and that that represented kind of a point where that turned around where it was like, okay, maybe initially people suspected, okay, maybe it was the Russians, you know, maybe it was the Cubans, the communists or whatever. But by like 1975, oh man, it was the CIA. You know, it's, yeah. it's like, yeah. It, and, and the Warren Commission, they were part of it, too. They were there to cover up the whole thing. You know, everything is tainted. There, There's there's no trust in, in the evidence, even. You know, it's it's ridiculous. What do you, uh, you go into McCarthyism any at all on any of this? Uh, the, the only thing, like, like because, like, I one thing that I wanted to kind of, um, one thing that I really wanted to get across is a lot of people look back on the Kennedy assassination as this moment where everything fell apart. Like, like this, this is the point where America died, you know, that not just Kennedy died, but well, yeah, people died, that Camelot you know? thesis, right? Yeah. Yeah. The whole, the whole, the whole Camelot do, thing, do whatever you need to do. Oh, you need no, to pull no, slack on that cord. Yeah, it's, it's but right. Right. The whole, the whole thing with the, with, with, yeah, with the Camelot myth and all that, 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 yeah, that this was the point where, where America died, where, where post-war America ceased to be, you know, where, where prosperity or this, uh, just, this this feeling of positive goodness you know died with kennedy in in 63 and that uh, things had been going south before that you know it's it's like there are always issues there are always problems but we have the tendency to look back with this certain nostalgia on on things and the conspiracy theorists really really brought the nostalgia factor into it you know though this kennedy he was you know he stood for civil rights he was against the war in vietnam and and so they sort of build him up into this mythic figure and that's where you get this right good versus evil thing oh kennedy he was such a good man you know he's such such a good president he would have you know if he hadn't he died we wouldn't have yeah, wouldn't have wife or anything. Right, yeah yeah right you know <laughs> <laughs> but but right that problems existed before that right you had the red scare you had the fear of communism you had people like you know people were terrified that that the russians were going to just press the button down and kill us all you know that sort of thing dr strange love yeah right yeah like, what did that come out 1960 uh, i want to say either yeah or maybe yeah early 60s definitely right stanley kubrick duck uh, and cover uh, videos uh, yeah shown right the kids. you know i mean that's the environment that my parents grew up in right and it was you cool know? hearing your dad yeah, talk about yeah that. you know people people building bombs shelters in their backyards and stuff like that but i mean you also had uh even though uh, world war ii and the korea korean war had been over with you still had an increased military presence it wasn't going away so you have this certain level of secrecy right that is 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 continuing which that that aids this distrust thing eventually right you got people keeping secrets of course it's gonna it's going to backfire at some point. But right, the things things were bad. I mean, you can even talk about the issues right with civil rights. You know, with with desegregation. Right, you know, George it, Wallace. Man. Right, you know, standing in the doorway, right? Trying trying to block a um I don't forget I got his name from getting in you know to to the college there right you know I you mean, ever listen to him talk uh to johnson on like the white house tapes the lbj tapes oh uh, yeah yeah that's Holy that's great shit yeah i mean that's uh, because uh that's that's where because uh, johnson gives him the treatment right isn't that what they call it the treatment where it's yeah. like like because johnson had had a way with uh kind of persuading what, people. he was the whip right right he was, yeah uh, the speaker of the house right yeah yeah he had a certain way with with persuading people which which ties into another aspect of this, too, because uh, the Warren Commission was headed by Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was former governor of California. He was on the Supreme Court. Supreme Court Justice, he's, he's the one who, who kind of helped pioneer the Brown versus Board of Education thing, right? Wow. And, and that uh, in the week or two weeks after uh, the assassination, Johnson wants to get together this committee, right? Because he's like, we have people want answers, you know? Yeah, they want answers and and you know we, we got to give it to him before the situation spirals out of control so he he says i want this committee to be headed by earl warren because he's one of the most trusted people in this country right so he phones up earl warren and he's like hey i want you to be on this committee and earl warren's like no i, I don't want to do this you know i, I don't want to be a part of this what so, was his uh, reasoning i i don't i don't know what his exact reasoning was but i know that he didn't want to be involved with it right but johnson gives him the treatment right because he's like all right okay if you don't want to do this, if you don't want to head this committee, 40 million people are going to die because we're going to have a nuclear war on our hands, right? Because uh, people are going to be blaming the Soviets, you know? So, yeah, you're going to have 40 million dead people just here in the United States. That's interesting. Yeah, you know, yeah. (laughs) 
Because, yeah, because it, there was like, I mean, that uh, if the, if the uh, well, I mean, shit, if the Oswald narrative is was it was the original Warren Commission that there was Soviet involvement um, through via Oswald or that Oswald was a, a patsy or, or, you know, like he had tried to defect, but they didn't want him. Uh, see, like like the interesting thing with the Warren Commission and Oswald is that the Warren Commission technically never found a motive for why Oswald did what he did. So instead, they they try to paint him out as kind of this loser that he's like uh, just like a political malcontent that he's just like an antisocial type person and and you know that, that he's, he's he's unstable right and and that that that's the reason why but of course that doesn't satisfy people right when you look at it and you're like hey this guy defected to Russia like in you know 1960 or whatever and he came back here you know and it's like okay well he was uh, uh, when he was in the Marine Corps or whatever he was uh, working at with uh, um, like uh, radar stuff in japan you know and it's like huh you know was he possibly intelligence you know that sort of thing that's he, he knows how to speak russian you know <laughs> or he was learning how to speak russian when he was a marine so people you know kind of get suspicious of that at that point right even especially when you have uh, the warren commission right who who can't present a a discernible motive for why oswald did what what he did other than oh well he was probably unstable and upset in some way you know <laughs> he was upset with his own life and he wanted to to write his name in the history books or whatever but um and and even even members of the warren commission recognized that it was kind of like a thin defense or to, to put that out there yeah like there there is a, a memo that was issued by one of the commission lawyers a guy named wesley Liebler. liebler it's like 24 pages where he just rips into like the commission's evidence. And I mean, this is among these are amongst the 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 council. These are the guys who are writing the report, right? And he's like, "No, you can't put this in here, you know? You can't put this in here because you're going to be uh you're you're going to be helping an eventual opposition. You know, there's going to be people who are going to call this into question at some point, mm. you know. Yeah, which and, definitely happened. Right, which which did happen. And I mean that's that's over not just like the motive but like the evidence itself. Like I mean like like the assertion that Oswald carried the rifle into the Texas School Book Depository building because or, well he had to break down the rifle and put it in a bag or whatever, but the witnesses claimed that the bag was too small to contain the Manlitcher Carcano rifle, you know, and it's like you can't put that in there. You can't you can't assert that as evidence, you know, because it's all completely circumstantial and there's really nothing to support it. You mentioned this in your defense, uh, and I, I, I've heard stuff like this, um, but it, it brings me to another question. Like you mentioned the grassy knoll kind of idea. Yeah. But the, the, the umbrella-wielding gun. <laughs> okay, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. But, okay, so these eyewitnesses yes. from this area of the uh, event uh, the, over by the knoll or around uh, people that would have seen or heard things. There's a conspiracy out there that, like, you know, there's 69 of them and 62 of them have met a mysterious yes, death or yes, something like that. Like, yes. what, have you done any looking into that? Is that yeah, all? Yeah, I mean, I mean that 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 plays a part in the common assassination narrative, or uh, if if you want to refer to it as that. That was like originally started by a guy named uh, Penn Jones Jr., who was like a Dallas. Or, well, he was a, a newspaper owner in a, a small place called Middle Othian, Texas. It was like right outside Dallas. And, and he's, he's really the proponent, one of the guys who puts forth this theory that, hey, man, these people are dropping dead, you know? And it's like, uh, yeah, there's some suspicious things going on here. They saw stuff. And, uh, right, that, that, that the conspiracy, and it, it shows in a way that, that people are, at least in the conspiracy community at this point, thought that the conspiracy is still active. You know, it's still going on. They're still keeping tabs on things that are happening out here. They're they're monitoring the situation, and whenever some issue appears, they that is a theory on this Epstein know? shit. Right. I just yeah. saw just today, like some lawyer, or somebody connected to Epstein, December fourth commits right. suicide, apparent suicide or something. And like I've been seeing several of those go around, but the articles are older. That right. the art this article was December fourth. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, but like like a lot of this stuff is just like it's it's just it's just people like looking looking for something that isn't there. You know, it's like okay, there there was a, an eyewitness who uh, saw uh, 
Oswald go back to his boarding house and allegedly a cop car pulls up out front and honks the horn like they're going to pick up Oswald. And it's like, hey, the Dallas Police Department are in on it now, right? But uh, like, like th- this was like, I think his landlady, and but she like died of a heart attack. But they still throw her into that list. Or there's a guy named Lee Bowers who was a, a uh, mm-hmm. operator in a, a railroad tower that was in the parking lot behind the Texas school book depository building who claimed during the shooting, he saw some suspicious behavior behind the fence there that he saw maybe two, two people. And during when the motorcade came through, there was I've like a that. flash yeah, of light yeah, yeah, yeah. or something and something caught his attention and he dies in a car crash where allegedly he's like, uh, yeah, he, he dies in a car crash. I believe it was in middle Othian, Texas where Penn Jones was from. And, and that, that he's under some strange duress when they pull him out of the car. Cause like, I mean, he's alive or whatever, but he dies at the hospital, but it's just like the guy could have just had a stroke or a heart attack. You know, I mean, it yeah. could easily happen, but it's like, Oh my God, they just CIA must've like poisoned him or something. You know, it must've been that poison umbrella dart or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. That, yes, man. So let me ask you this. Like, what do you think, uh, what do you think the future of this project is? Like uh, you mentioned, maybe a dissertation, yeah. uh, you, a publication. Uh, how do you, do you make this like the central focus with maybe some bookends? Do you do you try and apply uh, like a like maybe Kennedy is the bottle and there's bottlenecks on both ends, yeah. or, or is this going to go into like are you going to do part two ninety three to present? Like what? Wh- well, see, I mean, I would like to do the 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 ninety three to present thing but it's just it would be so hard because the internet has just there there's so many different different theories out there now it's like it's easier to keep track of them when they're like uh, before the internet when it's all like yeah i mean you had tv of course but it's like everything is mostly literature based fascinating to me well like you did uh this the sources you talked about like it seems like you've you've you have really uh opened up the literary narrative of this and yeah. examined it and researched it and uh, analyzed it and it seemed but why well, you mentioned the JFK film right, right? yeah what about like so I just thought of this like uh, the the scene you just described with the cop car like that's in X-Files right like yeah. there are all yeah, of these yeah. shows right. really too uh, in the digital age or a television age right. that, that have in one way or another have sought to uh, because it's in our collective right memory now right and, and uh, well they, they also I- I influence that popular Kennedy assassination conspiracy narrative well, like yeah like yeah. the Irishman right. I mean that just right. hit Netflix the other day right so so now you'll probably hear people talking about the mafia now being involved that'll in, be back right? in. yeah that'll be back now it's like I know? kept thinking about your like almost like an EKG yeah it's yeah, like because yeah. it's like periods where you're like oh we got a conspiracy spike yeah and now yeah. We're, we're just kind of this is chatter boom, we, yeah. right right <clears throat> I mean and that's that's part of the reason why I decided to research this and write this and because yeah I noticed it too and I'm like yeah hey what what is going on you know it's like people I mean of course people are still interested in it but yeah what is creating these enormous spikes in interest and uh yeah a lot of it right like like the JFK film when it came out, yeah, I mean that just blew people's minds when that you know, star-studded cast too. Yeah, right. I mean, right. <laughs> right. You got Oliver Stone, who's like this hot Hollywood filmmaker. And Isn't he like Putin's daughter's godfather or some shit like that too? Is he? Did I? I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not not entirely sure. Uh, somebody was. Hey, we could be social media like but, i saw an article on social media but, linking him to putin somehow. like like i i mean i could probably write a whole paper on just jfk the film alone just how much it influences just how people think of the assassination it's like it's like okay when most people think about the kennedy assassination the first thing that they see in their heads is this is a pruder film that 26 second home movie which i mean like i remember the first time I saw yeah it. you know i mean it's shocking right i mean I, of course now we're like more desensitized to this stuff you know on the internet or whatever but you know it's but it's like like as far as like the conspiracy narrative it's like the jfk movie did so much to like solidify that one of the techniques that stone used is that as a filmmaker he used a lot of like the same film 
the same film grain and everything in order to film his reenactments. So it's it's almost impossible to tell the difference between real footage and fake footage. What I know, you know. Uh, that was an right. interesting technique. So he, he just completely like like just broke that, you know, and where where you it's unless you're like ultra trained, you know, and it's like okay, I've seen this before. This is in the archives or whatever, you know. Yeah, you can't tell the difference, right? And that that Stone himself said when making the film that that he was intentionally trying to make his own counter narrative, his own counter myth to the Warren Commission report that that because he was accused of, oh, hey, you're you're bending these facts. You can't do that. He's saying it's necessary. It's necessary to bring out the truth, even if I have to lie a little bit. You know, (laughs) you ever watch his uh, secret history of the United States on Netflix? Uh, I have not. I've great seen uh, i mean i've seen it of course on netflix but i haven't watched it because like yeah i i didn't i i figured if it's oliver stone it's like okay yeah it's just going to be conspiracy mania you know it's, a lot of it was but i mean it was it was too it was, it was stuff that we're talking about really like gulf right, of tonkin and right and stuff like that uh i, I didn't think that he made right. super serious reaches trying to uh foment but right. discontent or and whatever i, I don't want to be distant in i don't, I don't want to want to put Oliver Stone necessarily across as, as completely disingenuous in, in the way that let's he, see if he's connected to Putin first that, that <laughs> right. well no 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 what, what, what I'm saying is, is, is that Oliver Stone as a person I mean a lot of his outlook on the Kennedy assassination is influenced by the fact that he was a combat veteran a decorated combat veteran in Vietnam and when he came back to the United States he felt completely disillusioned by the country that he came back to yeah. and that that sort of fueled sort of how he felt about about his country and about his government you know that that something had happened you know and mm-hmm. that that influences right jfk the film like yeah. greatly i'm gonna have to watch i've been wanting to watch i've been oh on it's a, a great i've film. been on a civil well you said you were to watch ken burns I'm yeah, civil yeah every war. november man every that's november awesome. watch uh, ken burns the civil war and then it's like december move on to baseball that's that's another another good good documentary yeah um yeah. i mean i published that or, i posted i posted that article that i read that yeah that was yeah I, I thought so too and i mean how do you feel about that uh, not to get away from the no the no, no i thing, but, that is um well, like what, with what you were saying with like the lost cause yeah, thesis, like yeah. I've been, I've been reading into that more and more and like, that's my, my interest on the civil war, like today, like I was talking to some of my students is the, the ideological differences of the common person that was fighting in the war right, yeah. versus like Jeff Davis and Abe Lincoln. Right, you know, right. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, right. From bottom up instead of like a top down type, yeah. type viewpoint. Yeah. Right. And, and what the average Confederate from, uh, let's say Mississippi who didn't own slaves, like how they were vested. Yeah. Like and, and how they got them to be vested. But I do agree, man. Like that's, it, it, there needs to be an update. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I would be fine uh, with Ken Burns redoing an update because he's such a good filmmaker. But yeah. I also like one thing, um, like they're kind of pointing out like, Hey, you got this dude in here. He's pretty much a, a confederate apologist right that would be shelby foot yeah, yeah and he gets know. 45 minutes right, of time yeah. and this lady over here who says yeah. it's real about slavery, she only get like uh like two minutes of talk right and i think there should be that was the thing yeah, yeah it should, it should, right it should be more balanced in that way yeah it's like right man it, yeah check out the wikipedia article on shelby foot and you'll you'll find some real gym quotes in there you know just mm-hmm. like man but he, he's a good storyteller you know i mean <laughs> he was a good yeah here, yeah, here we know? are on the story yeah you know we're we're back to uh, probably bad historians but terrible or, or but, but good good storytellers you know because it but that's that's because like it, it appeals to something in people you know it, and that's that's what i was trying to say with this thesis in a way is is that people distrusted the government and they turned to conspiracy theories because it to them it, it's it's personal it provides them sort of like it, it allows them in a way to influence their own history and to explain where how how we got to this point in ways that seem tangible to them because i mean most people were affected by the vietnam war right yeah I mean, you know yeah i had an uncle that uh was killed in the vietnam war oh. so i mean i never knew him obviously yeah but uh quang tree province in 68 yeah i think it was 60 it was, it was a real hot time period of right, the war, like 67 right. 68 69 
but uh yes and what was uh, crazy is like uh, and i did some research i did a documentary with woods about this and uh but my grandpa was a world war ii vet okay uh yeah it was in utah beach normandy and he um did not want his son to go in his son volunteered oh, yeah. and he was trying to get him to move to canada like <laughs> yeah like, like that yeah. was that was a uh a uh, World War II World War II vet who went from Normandy all the way through patriotic as all get out right. did not believe in at that time that he volunteered uh, in the Vietnam War didn't want to get involved was like hey everybody's moving to Canada right now uh, yeah. let's get you out there and he's like no I'm volunteering like you served in World War II like how could I not do this right but to see the difference in that World War II vet, and I mean, I know yeah, probably yeah, no parent yeah, yeah, wants yeah. their son right. to go off, but I, I always thought that was such a dichotomy. Yeah, like to 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 see the two different generations, man. And right, it's, it's wild. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, f- formal graduations coming up for yep. you. You're about to have your first child. Yeah. Uh, anything else going on? Any new plans? Things exciting? You can- <laughs> overarching goals for the next 10 years of your life well i mean yeah at some point i would like to get my doctorate but i mean that's probably going to be a little bit me too yeah. man i really would like yeah. I, I actually like i text core after going to on campus i talked with pearson and woods and all these dyke and my document told me to call him peter i was like yes mr peter <laughs> he's like this could be a transitional version of my name peter yeah <laughs> like i was like yes sir <laughs> like it's just is it's weird but uh like i i just I love teaching and I've been like yeah. a student again, you know, and it's, uh, it sucks not being a student like, yeah, like you just got done being or currently still right. technically are or whatever. It, that was such a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, I agree when I mean, when the, I, I went into, uh, to graduate school, uh, I, I really didn't have any, any preconceptions about what it was going to be like, you know, I'm like, Hey man, it's kind of mysterious, you know, it's going to be an adventure or whatever. And it's like, yeah, you know, you get in there and it's, uh, it's like, okay, I got to write a 24, 25 page paper, you know, that I've never done anything like this before. And you know, how, how far, how long did your thesis turn out being? Uh, it's as plus bibliography. I want to say it's like 225 pages. Wow. Something like Dude, that. Mine ended up being like 154 or something with the well, bibliography. As far as I understand it, it's like 80s, the gold standard or whatever. So, uh, you know, we went above and beyond, you know, the call of duty here. So I'll tell you had to though. You, I tell you had to, to make it, yeah to talk about well, the narrative yeah. and then interject your thing because right. like this with, with us i kept like i felt like asking you what your opinions on the different conspiracies were right. but you can't not say what they are yeah without talking about the overall thesis of like this is why <laughs> right well it, it 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 became longer as well i mean right because it's an interesting story to begin with right it's an interesting construction of just how you go from small plot to just cast of thousands possibly being involved in this thing but i mean it does have it does have personal value to me too because i mean my parents were both alive when kennedy was shot and they have these really distinct memories of where they were at when they heard about it of what they felt you know at the time that it happened and to me it kind of illuminated how um how people of these eras kind of probably felt about that they were personally invested in it and that like television i mean really comes of age during this point that people remember seeing specific things on oh i remember seeing oswald get shot on live television you know or you know i remember seeing the funeral of of uh kennedy on tv or you know that's that sort of thing but that it creates this singular experience uh you know actually ray trower the psych professor i work with just yesterday was telling me he remembered I told him I was doing this podcast with you. Yeah. Uh, he's like, man, I remember Kennedy's funeral. Yeah. And he said, I'll never, he's like, I was watching on TV with my parents. He's like, I'll never forget the sound of those horses. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. There's, there's, there's something deeply, deeply affecting about that. That is like ingrained into the minds of like, and, and I mean, maybe in a way it's like us with, with the September 11th, 2001 thing. Right. It's, it's like, like a loss of innocence. Man. Right. It, but it's like, yeah, you remember where you were, you remember the visuals, you know, you remember certain things about it and, and it just like stirs up all kinds of feelings in, inside when you think about them. And I think, right. That the Kennedy assassination was one of those, 
those things. And I think television, like, like it's kind of like when, when you were at thesis defense and kind of like what my dad was saying, right. Yeah. Is, is that television really helps cement this as being this big event, you know? Yeah. Like that's like, I was thinking when he was talking about that, about like fireside chats, like how yeah. it gone from yeah. radio to, and right. like I've, we've talked about that into different classes I've taken. Um, but that transition of right. like it used to be everybody sitting around the radio. Now we can see the Zapruder film. Yeah. And now we can now we can watch any of these documentaries on. Right. Now we can make our own documentary, put it on YouTube. You know, it's like right. Yeah. There's there's a different level of maybe you could say transparency in a way, right? I mean, or, or accessibility, accessibility, right? That's a great way. Accessibility, right? Because um, uh, the weekend of the assassination, Time Life uh, Incorporated, Time or, or Life Magazine bought the Zapruder film. Right, which is which is bizarre if you think about it, because he's like, well, this is a piece of evidence in a murder crime or whatever, right? But Life Magazine bought the Zapruder film for one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and that's in nineteen sixty three money, right? And then wow. they proceeded to kind of like hold a monopoly on the Zapruder film for like the next twelve years, where people didn't have explicit access to it. The only way you could get to it was either uh, through Life Magazine; they'd occasionally publish, uh, you know, if it was november the anniversary they'd publish frames from it or you could go to the national archives and view the battered copy that like the the warren commission had used that was like five or six generations removed from the original or or you even had researchers because they published the individual frames in uh, a, a, a supplemental volume of the warren commission's uh findings in, the, in their report one of their volumes which uh, you had researchers actually cutting them up and assembling them into like makeshift flip books in order to, to watch the film. Wow. But right, it wasn't until 75 that you get a, a guy who runs across a, a pristine like first generation 35 millimeter print who decides, hey, I'm going to show this on TV. And it just made people go nuts when they saw it. Like, because it's like, Oh my God, it looks like he's shot from the front, right? His head pitches backward and all that. It was like rocketed backward, right? And it's like, well, Time, Time Magazine uh, or Life Magazine is, they've, they've been keeping this film under wraps for like 12 years. Is there a reason for that? You know, it's like, because they don't want you to see the truth. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty ridiculous, but yeah. Man, the, the, you, you blown my mind many times. Too. No. Uh, they, they said, because it's just, it's thought provoking. Right. Yeah. But right. Because that, uh, yeah, that's, that's one thing that, that I, if I tend to mention, people are like, what, the Zapruder film wasn't like immediately available. You couldn't go, you know, people couldn't see it. And I was like, no, no, it wasn't because uh, Life Magazine treated it as a commodity. They were making money off of it, right? Because they're the ones who have the exclusive ownership to it. Go capitalism, which, man. Yeah, which, I mean, it's kind of morbid if you think about it, right? Which, when Zapruder sold the film, he tells the guy, who the representative, he's like, man, I don't, I want you guys to, don't exploit this. You know, I don't want to want to see this being shown on Times Square or whatever, because cause Zapruder himself had a, uh, he was very fond of President Kennedy, right? And that he didn't want this exploited, right? And I guess Life Magazine, in their own way, did exploit it, right, for for money. But uh, but you know, you, you fast forward like roughly thirty years after Zapruder makes that statement that hey, yeah, you know, don't don't exploit this. I don't want to see this in Times Square. And yet you can go watch JFK in the theater and and see that loop of the Zapruder film like over and over, back into the left, back into the left, right? And it's like, yeah. Yeah. It's just like completely against what, you know, the original guy wanted, you know, at that point. But yeah, it, it, right. Accessibility was limited and it was kind of like this taboo thing. You, the Zapruder film was this taboo thing. And that after the Jim Garrison trial, which is what the JFK movie is based on, is that Jim Garrison during the trial had subpoenaed the Zapruder film as evidence to be shown in court. You know, this is evidence of conspiracy is while it was in his possession, he legally makes bootleg copies of the film, which he then distributes out to researchers who are allied with his points of view, which is that it's this major military industrial complex CIA plot thing. So then they go around and show the Zapruder film to students at, on college campuses and sort of indoctrinate them into the conspiracy mindset. Man. And it's like, okay, well, this is the film they don't want you to see. And it's like, okay, for uh, the low price of like $6, you can buy the individual frames and take them home and study them yourself. You know, or you can buy a copy of the film that's seven generations removed from the original and just looks like mud. You Whoa. Know? But yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's an industry here, right? 
there's <laughs> wow i did not know any of that yeah that's, that's true true story so so yeah when when zapruder film gets aired on national television in 1975 on a program called good night america hosted by geraldo rivera yeah yeah geraldo right fantastic yeah, it makes sense right it, it totally makes sense but yeah is is that people lost their minds when they saw it because they're like oh my god this has been hidden from us for a reason you know and that's why almost immediately after that you get the foundation of the house select committee on assassinations in order to set the record right <laughs> What did what'd your dad think when the Sabrina film came out? Did he have any comments on that? Uh, well, see, my, my dad has actually, like, researched the Kennedy assassination, the event. Like, see, like, I, I kind of separate myself from the event. Like, I study, like, kind of the implications afterward of everything, right? The cultural kind of history of it. But um, is that, that both my parents remember 75 when Geraldo had the film on. They remember that. And, yeah, they remember being upset about it. Like, like, yeah, they remember being like, okay, yeah, there's a reason why these people are hiding this from us because, well, obviously he gets shot from the front, right? Even though I, I, you can argue physics all day about whether that's true or not. But yeah, is, is that, that they were, were genuinely upset about it. And it's one of the things that got my, my dad in, into to this was, was this, this event. And it also had to do with, because uh, he got into it kind of in the early 80s. And there was a book published by an author named David Lifton, and it was called Best Evidence. And Best Evidence was groundbreaking because it put forth the theory that President Kennedy's body had been surgery. Yeah, had been altered using clandestine like. I surgery. hadn't heard that. Yeah, I don't think I'd heard that. When yeah. you were, you brought that up a couple of times, yeah. like uh, you just like in review towards the end. Yeah, I was just it's, like, it's still a popular theory too. It's still a popular theory that that somehow in between. Uh, getting the president's uh, body from Parkland Hospital in Dallas to uh, Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland that, yeah, somehow uh, some kind of surgery or bullets were removed or, or the president's brain was removed or whatever in route. <laughs> and that there's this bizarre like shell game with coffins and stuff going on. Mm. And there, there are maybe two autopsies that occur and yeah, it's weird. I mean like, but that was like groundbreaking for its time because it was extremely well researched, even though it's theory is, is often thought as being completely just, just crazy. I mean like umbrella man type crazy stuff, right? Like, I mean, you even have conspiracy theorists, like uh, there's a guy named Dr. Cyril Wecht, who even makes a statement that he's, and he's a pathologist. I mean, he's a forensic pathologist. He's very well known. And he's like, you could give me like the best surgeons in the country and I wouldn't be able to achieve this feat in, in, in the matter of time that Lifton claims it was done. Right. Whoa. But, but what, what, I mean, the importance of best evidence isn't just because of this, this, this crazy theory with, with the body surgery, but the fact that Lifton is, and, and it becomes a trend. Lifton is, essentially asserting that the evidence itself the bedrock evidence of the case is is corrupted like like you can't be trusted right yeah yeah that 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 there there is 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 no there yeah there, there's there's no tangible objectivity in this that that it's it's all corrupted it's all bad all this evidence is bad <laughs> the evidence that has been fed to you <clears throat> is bad you know well i mean i could see like being able to imply that they would have dotted those eyes and crossed those t's like yeah if you're going to knock off the president are you not going to have all these contingency right, plans right. for yeah these people over here are going to see it and yeah uh we're, when we move it from here to here right. we're gonna well, have yeah yeah that's 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 right and i i think that's that's a very good point is 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 that that it's 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 like these these conspiracy theories have to be so perfect like nothing can go wrong. Everything has to go exactly. To I point. know that's what you know? that's the side of a conspiracy theory the where you start to get holes. It right, in right. Whole water. It's like everything. Like everything. Like it had to be just perfect. right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like the stars had to completely perfectly align for this moment to happen. And it's like, oh, well, that's totally how it happened. But it's like, you know, yeah, so you know, many that's, variables. Right. That's not. That's not real life. That's not how. That's not reality. But it's like, well, is this really reality? Then that's what you'd probably get from a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> well, <laughs> what's a craziest <laughs> conspiracy theory you've heard at all this like i'm surprised that like we haven't mentioned aliens or reptile people or anything oh like that. okay uh, but so, i mean like what's the craziest reach you've yeah, ever come across uh, you mean like with the kennedy assassination yeah or yeah just with like oh, okay. interpretation no, no, of the event I, or like yeah, okay. uh, yeah a, alien well, surgery is well how uh it, there's there's now a a um a popular a, a semi well okay 
I can I can actually give you a handful of them because some of them are just pretty outrageous. There's there's the there's a rather common prevalent theory, especially amongst the internet age, that the Zapruder film is a fraud. I can see that. Yeah, that 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 parts of it have either been substantially edited or uh had yeah have been altered in some way to hide the fact even though you had conspiracy theorists using the film for the past 50 years as proof of conspiracy i mean as, as the events of the film like hey you know right it, 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 <laughs> man it, you know it's it's weird right i mean it's but yeah that that the the, the film was was somehow altered um you've, you've got uh the you've even got people who claim that that it it didn't even happen I, I, you know that that has been the number one thing in my mind. Yeah, 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 right, thing. right. I'm right like, yeah, right, like, where's the body? Yeah, right. That, like that. It, like, did you just get him out of the jail? Like, yeah. the cameras malfunctioned. Yeah, like you, you got you got some people claiming it didn't happen. Then you, you've got another. There was a guy named uh, William Cooper who wrote a book called "Behold a Pale Horse" that was published in 1991. Uh, I mean, the, this guy was was pretty out there, uh, but his his interest was UFOs, right? Like extraterrestrials or whatever. But he claimed that Kennedy had to be killed because Kennedy was gonna let people in on the conspiracy that the government had been working in collusion with uh, uh, with extraterrestrials for uh, exchange of. Uh, technology technology for abductees or whatever that you know that aliens are running like this bizarre uh hybrid reproductive experiment thing and that that we're our government is getting technology in exchange for offering them test subjects you know <laughs> yeah it's i mean it's 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 Whoa. bizarre stuff yeah. yeah that's why well i mean i wondered that's why i was joking about right lizard people and shit like that because yeah so, it's it won the x-files thing too like they've done right. a couple they, they dance around the narrative but i mean there there's got to there is uh, that's the spectrum of this yeah like, like oswald did it and right right aliens yeah, yeah, did it yeah, like that's the yeah it's it's there's it's an incredible it's an incredible scale yeah or, you know, or it didn't happen wow right but it, it, what's weird is is that y- y- yeah you know you present that analogy right it's like you have oswald but then you have yeah like reptilian shapeshifters right and it's just like somehow how is how is Oswald did it like the counterbalance to this just completely crazy because it's like it's like yeah some people actually view that Oswald acting alone man that's there's no way you know I mean that's that's as crazy as as reptile aliens you know it's like you know yeah it's, yeah it's weird how that works right because it's like if you if you boil it down the Oswald solution it's the Occam's razor thing right it's 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 the rational the easiest explanation right it's it's the easiest means but of course it can't be that easy it's it has to be complicated right it, it, it there has to be more to it than this and and that's what ties in also to that whole hidden hidden elite the the deep state right there's there's always something behind something else there's always something going on in the dark something in the shadows you know the anonymous culture that's come up this is yeah kind of, yeah like that's like they're they're, they're allegedly the force of good you know like yeah yeah uh, and then there's a conspiracy theory that that's actually the bad force right right yeah that's i'm just like man right but uh, you know like what uh what's your assessment of all this like uh other than like your thesis of yeah we're suspicious right now yeah i mean what i just said but i mean like what's what's your what's your uh I guess you say unbiased take as a historian or like if you're teaching this in u.s history too to a freshman right what are you going to say to them like how are you going to explain like not just your thesis but like let's say you're just giving them the narrative like how do you put that like well you could say oswald did it but we don't know like i mean like like as a historian myself like how do i put it to my students right yeah see and and that's that's maybe like the hardest part in this is right is that right i mean in historiography classes and all that you're you're pretty much trained to try to check your biases at the door right that but unfortunately you know we're all human and we can't do that you know there's no way to really your bias is going to be there in some some way it's it's always going to be there it's it's the create creative side of what we do right yeah yeah there's always going to be some some point of view some some uh some point of view so but it's it's like um like with this whole Kennedy assassination thing, it's like, well, I mean, like how, how do, how do I feel about it? You know? And it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I just don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's because the waters have been muddied so much, you know, over the past. Well, uh, what, what I would say is that 
I'm of the opinion that I would I'm I would say about 94% convinced that Oswald acted alone. Okay? But I wouldn't say 95 because 95 is then when you're going beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So I wouldn't be able to convict Oswald in a court of law just because there is that doubt. There is always and I mean I think it's good that people ask questions. I think it's good that, you know, you point cuz there are some strange things going on, right? There there are strange things that did happen. There are things that still can't be explained. I mean, uh, you know, there are certain aspects of the case that, yeah, are still a little nutty, you know, but it's like, uh, it's like, yeah, I wouldn't be able to convict Oswald. And in a way that means the conspiracy theorists have won, right? Mm. Because there's, there's always going to be that doubt. doubt there's always gonna be, and, and right. That's, that's what's important, right? It, or, or they, that's like kind of the central, one of the bottom lines of this whole thing is that they, these conspiracy theorists, uh, like the early critics or even beyond that they introduced this sort of seed of doubt that just flourished into like this this whole forest of just craziness you well know? it turned Distrust, into the suspicion you it, know people say this all the time they're like you know they like Right, yeah, they. But that, right, that, yeah, when you say simple, they, yeah. it's not like I mean, you said a second ago talking about the conspiracy theorists or whatever. But like, I, I've picked up on that. Like people all the time are like, you know, they, and I'm like, who's yeah, yeah, they, yeah, man? Yeah. Everybody's talking about they, right? And it's but that's that deep state shadow for yeah. the people that are really controlling the uh, the switches or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's well, I mean, and, and it it it. it, it it's popular because it explains things to people because it, it offers them because like if, if you just say, okay, yeah, Oswald killed Kennedy acted alone. It, then it's just like an isolated event, right? It's, it's, it's just, it's complete circumstance at that point. There is a, uh, an author named William Manchester. He wrote a book in 1967 called the death of a president. And it was a popular bestseller. And it, it was, um, but, uh, he was, he was, a uh, right. Definitely allied with like the Warren commission and all that. But he, in 1993, after uh, JFK gets released, he writes an article, an editorial piece for the New York Times, in which he presents this analogy for why people believe in conspiracy theories, especially with the Kennedy assassination. And the theory, or, or the the sort of analogy that he uses is like he's like, imagine if you have two scales, right? You have like like uh, world's biggest crime, world's biggest criminals, right? Which his his analogy is the Holocaust and the nazis right it balances out because you you've got the worst crime you've got the worst criminals right and he says the kennedy assassination doesn't do that because you have kennedy great leader great man and you have what he calls the quote wretched waif oswald right on the other side of that scale and it just doesn't balance out and that's why people that's a great metaphor yeah that's that's why that's why people believe in these conspiracy theories and i do think that he is right to a certain extent however i do think that that he could have elaborated on that further because it's not just the disparity between kennedy and oswald it's people they're 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 putting their country in that scale as well they're putting their trust their faith in government in that scale as well and that the conspiracy theories explain why we ended up at this point why we don't trust the government why the government is evil you know that sort of thing and and that it spoke to people more than it did the the official narrative you know well what's fascinating is this explains more than anything you know what i'm saying like your th- like your thesis like it's that is the explanation uh, yeah. of like what i need honestly is like okay yes like you, what you call a greater American mythology or whatever. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's become. Right. And, yeah, and to is. this be able to arrive at that conclusion is somewhat helpful to me as someone who's been had passing interest in this. Yeah. Because Woods and I have talked about this. He yeah. teaches a spies class. And I've had him for that class. Yeah. And that really undermined my faith and introduced all this suspicion into my life. Right. It is, we as humans, like we have to know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like the uncertainty will drive us to create the, the, all of this narrative right. and, and this to satiate even like what you're saying with Oliver Stone even if it's like yeah, yeah I'll just bend this a little bit just a little yeah introduce, yeah introduce this character like well I mean uh, but how is that any, any different like in academia I was talking about something with uh, Christianity have you taken the history of Christianity uh no um but so did jesus sources of jesus's life there's this two document hypothesis that says all these red letter quotes in the bible jesus never wrote anything so where does that come from right 
and they're like, well, it's a two document hypothesis that these two gospels built on Mark and Q. Yeah. And Q is gone. We don't know what happened to it. They destroyed it in Jewish wars or whatever. But yeah, but but really, that's just a reach. Right. Right. But it's like, that's the things we do to come up with explanations. But like, I mean, literally, I, 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 it's an interesting thesis. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We'll just create a way. Right. Because there's got to be some other document, right? Where are these red letters? The sayings of Jesus, Q. Mark plus Q equals this book of the Bible. It is kind of the thesis. Yeah. And I'm like, but, but Q is invented as a variable, as a possible explanation with zero proof. Right, yeah. And we do that. Yes, yes, we and, do. And, and you read about the two document hypothesis and it's interesting, it's fascinating, but it's like, man, that could be a rabbit hole in and of itself. Right, yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's that's that. And, and right, this this uh, ties into that, right, whole historiographical question of can we know the truth? You know, what what is truth? What even is objective truth? What, you know, what, because there, there are so many different versions of it. And, and uh, with this Kennedy assassination narrative thing and the fact that, that people, you know, buy into it and believe it, but it's, it's, um, it just, it's, it's, it's the truth because it explains things. That's, that's my, my whole thing about, you know, why, why people buy into this because it, and because it puts them in the story as well. They're, they're a factor in it. In a, in a way because a lot of, of the theories also have to do with this right individual versus society individual versus government and we look often to write characters and in, in literature and stories and whatnot for uh, uh we, we we look to we try to identify with people right so it's like a lot it, it's 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 no wonder that eventually kennedy becomes this sort of um archetype for just american greatness right and you cut down you know and and you even get the reversal of of oswald right who by the 1980s well he was innocent he was he was just some government agent who thought he was doing his job and he you know he got like flim flammed or whatever by the government and that could happen to you you know that sort oh, of thing yeah right you know so it's it's kind of weird right how, uh, how that yeah. works but but right i mean there are like so many different <laughs> different levels to this i mean that go and uh, that's part of the reason why i thought it was important to study. Uh, i could because probably... i've done several three-hour podcasts and uh like i drank a lot of water and coffees i'm trying to stay hydrated all the time cause, yeah because i exercise and uh it becomes a challenge sometimes <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah rejuvenated good um so yeah man this is so outside of your phd you're gonna try and make a, a career out of this like i mean is this uh, i feel like you yeah, could do a yeah, podcast over this topic uh, and never run out of things to talk about I, I i probably could but it's it's like uh i mean like yeah i'd probably like to like i you know I'd, I'd like to get this work published and and just kind of expand upon it i mean like I, okay yeah it's probably kind of like like easy it's like everybody you know, i'm an american historian well of course you are you're american you know that sort of thing but it's like 20th century american but it's like i just feel like like there's there's a lot of different subjects um are there there are some subjects that that can really be mined especially for like this distrust thing and i think that that's like like really because like i would probably define like the last 50 years of like the 20th century as being like the age of suspicion right the age of distrust yeah you know and yeah you could say that that got kicked off with like the red scare or whatever right because it's like internal external enemies like there's sort of this what sort of events beyond the kennedy assassination do you think maybe eroded trust more uh, Besides, you know, get out of, uh, let's say, post-Vietnam. Even. Right. Like uh, it, you mentioned, I think, uh, the Contras and yeah, some different things. But, uh, it, I mean, it just kind of, it does seem like it's a road versus just like a big blip with the Kennedy assassination. Right. It's like it keeps uh, well, Gulf Tom, yeah. Pentagon Papers. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Just, just people just tend to be reminded or whatever that you know hey our government's up to no good or whatever and that you know how high does this thing go you know and with the contras of course it goes all the way to reagan right you know <laughs> which everybody deifies yeah right. like i, I see yeah, these everybody. memes of reagan and i'm like uh, <laughs> i mean like yes his persona was a very nice man right like, yeah he's definitely charismatic but yeah like, but he lied like on tv as, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah it's right but but like how my dad remembers reagan is not at all how i see him right 
and he lives through the Reagan years and stuff, but he's just operating off what he saw on TV from yeah. that time, not what yeah. he's researched. Um, are, have you thought about doing any articles or any th- excerpts of this um, uh, publication wise? Maybe. I mean, I don't, I just got, you know, since I just got done with the, the, the thesis or whatever, I'm kind of like on, even though I'm like talking about this in depth, you know, I'm kind of like trying to kind of, cool off right now for i know me, man you know? dude like, i went through a big period yeah, of that i didn't really do it's like like i uh, this project i probably read more than i had it all the points of my life combined you know so it's like it's like man i just feel like i'm on overload you know but yeah <laughs> it, it, burnout's real man yeah it, it, right. it, it is and uh, i think you can get burnout from like doing too much of one thing or just doing too much of everything right like i've experienced both honestly. yeah but I mean, like, like, yeah, of course I would like to get this work published. Part of the reason, too, is because I feel like, uh, I mean, that definitely helps with your resume if you're, like, trying to get into, like, a, a PhD program, right? It's like, you know, you got somebody, oh, okay, I've had an article published here, and I'm like, I got a book. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is, that, yeah. and I mean, I have no publications. I've got an honorable mention. It's, in like it's, a, a book. That's cool. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You yeah, know, I just, man, that you're is what a, you're doing, you know, I mean, that's, it is a big goal. I, I would love to turn my thesis into a book um, and deal with more Cold War era stuff. Okay. Right. Like yeah. Mao Zedong burned all of the Kung Fu material he could get his hands on yeah. after he turned it into Wushu. You know, like uh, uh, the, the guy who invented Sambo in Russia was ousted for being a Japanese spy because yeah. he got his black belt from the guy that invented Judo. You know, like th- things like that. Like that's those are, those are some things that were uh, parts of my thesis of like um, – same sort of territory you're covering of like the Eastern totalitarian versus Western liberal Democratic yeah, societies yeah, yeah, yeah. and how uh, martial arts became this nationalistic supreme thing. I mean, even Vladimir Putin has a black belt in judo, <laughs> but uh, Teddy Roosevelt did judo in the basement of the White House. Like it's yeah. it's been it's been something that like we've engaged in for supremacy reasons. Yeah, even like so JFK in my thesis, I cite him going to Fort Bragg. And the training that they are doing is a byproduct of the development of this one guy that wrote about my thesis. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting. That it's like it was a, our martial arts military traditions were yeah. really starting to culminate under Kennedy. Yeah. Right. And, um, and he was all about it. Like uh, Ellsberg wrote this uh, paper before the Pentagon papers uh, were published, of course, but it was called Counter-Revolutionary Judo in Vietnam. They were trying to use the philosophy behind that, because judo was made by a a guy who worked for Tokyo Imperial University. He was like the president of the university, basically. And it's very intellectual, but he's like, let's take the strategy of overcoming the opponent here and we'll use it on the communist guerrillas. Like, don't you see? Right. Right. Uh, But it's just like to, I love the 45 to present era, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree agree too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Everything we've talked about on this podcast and what pisses me off actually is like, I haven't got to teach. I taught, I taught Civ 2 three times, but I haven't even taught you to yet yeah but it's good because like i feel like i have more content material and just like talk about in that era that it's good that they've got me like doing us yeah i I mean i got i got set on this this path with uh with this thesis and all that because i took uh my first semester in grad school i mean i took historiography which which i mean that helps of course who was your professor for that uh dr dagma yeah that's who i had yeah. yeah, which I mean, that, you know, that was that was a good class. Like, like I'm like, hey, what's this historiography thing? You know, it's like I walk in, you know, I'm like, I don't. And after that, I'm like, man, mine's blown at this point. You know, it's like objective truth. There's no such thing. You know that. You know? <laughs> but it's it's like the other class that I took that semester was uh, uh, U.S. history, uh, 1945 to 2001, with uh, Dr. Moses, and uh, that like set me on like this whole path toward this this thing because I wrote a, a paper in there about the Zapruder film. Uh, Moses has uh, yeah. done a lot of work with this. I remember him giving a talk on it one time. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I, I wrote a, a paper over the Zapruder film, and and in a way, it was kind of like the template. I because like I'm like, man, interpretations of this film just like vary over the years. You know, it's like people are using it. For, it's like the uses and misuses of the film, if how like. Uh, lone nut supporters used it or how conspiracy theories used it or how it was reflected in culture, you know, that sort of thing. And that, that, but yeah, then that class, like, like that was a good class, 
you know I've, and i would say that yeah that that period especially like like the i would say like the 50s and the 60s and even the 70s yeah that is just like a fertile period for just like the complete meltdown oh of just yeah. like you did like united states society like it's the center just like collapses you know i mean that's by the 60s of course that's where you can go with your 1968 thing right like yeah that's right we should plan some future podcasts well, yeah i mean i'm, I'm completely also i get dude we gotta get you and barlow here at the same yeah, time yeah, i okay. told him the I mean, same that's, thing that's that's completely cool get a couple of see i didn't know that, that he had even done a podcast with you until like my sister julie she told me she's like yeah jeremy's been on there before and i was like really you know i was like yeah and i was like brian's been trying to get me on here for like a year you know and i'm like yeah, i send out you know? feelers to people every week man. yeah um honestly I, I had a period where i didn't um i kind of like read my I, I was figuring out what i wanted to do with this, the room and everything yeah and i for one podcast i decided i was like i'm gonna have chairs like so i had i did this setup with these two chairs yeah and i was like i hate that so i put the table back in here <laughs> right because I, I thought we were going to move to the new gym sooner so i thought i would have my new st- i thought i'd be recording at the gym most of the yeah. time but i have those chairs set up at my office now so like if, it, i'm in moralton if i want to get like uh, i'm gonna try and get uh de black to come in and talk to my oh, Arkansas history yes. class man i love dr DeBlack. yeah yeah it's it's like uh um Right, since I was uh, I was working as a teaching assistant for Doctor Jones, it's like we we tried to. Oh tell, yeah, I emailed yeah, her because um, yeah. Doctor De Black was like um, told me to get a hold of her to see if he had she had any of his stuff to give to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. But the like uh, like uh, it's it's just like trying to tell students like about like Doctor De Black. You know, it's like it's just like man, this guy's a legend. You know, I, I like, have his book Fire and Sword. I yeah, believe, yeah. The, and, like uh, the definitive book on the oh, Civil man. War in Arkansas. Yeah, you know, it's like, but yeah, because I I had De Black for a class that was uh, 19th century American biography. Wow. And, it was great, man. Like I learned a lot, you know, and 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 of course I know uh, De Black still goes around and gives uh, lectures. And he stuff. has so much good content, yeah. on YouTube. That oh, I didn't me. know he was on on. on uh, well, YouTube? he doesn't have his own channel, but oh, man, there's okay. probably a dozen lectures. And if you look at the ADTN stuff, yeah, like okay. of yeah, where yeah, he's yeah, either yeah. a talking head with other historians, yeah, or he's given a definitive like there's one i talk on there that he does over the civil war in the ozarks okay yeah. and brooks blevins also it's like it was like a, a conference yeah but there's several times like that the old state house museum where he the he brooks baxter where he gives these talks and it's like man that's the lecture you gave when i took this class. <laughs> yeah, yeah like that that is it so it's like man i got to pull probably i don't know 10 lectures that I gave yeah. out of 45 from the black on YouTube. Yeah. We, you know, and I, it's been, cause it'd been a while since I'd taken that course, but I, I like teaching Arkansas history. Yeah. I didn't think I would, but yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Arkansas history is great. I don't know why people knock it. You know, it's like, I, well, I was telling my class today, it's like, what did, cause I, one of the part of their essay was like, uh, this finals coming up. It's like, tell us, tell me what you thought about the class. Yeah. You know, just like, yeah bonus points pretty much but it's like you know how, how, what did you think did did you come in here with mis- uh, pre uh, conceptions about how it would be and did they change uh, and I remember taking to black and leaving and having a more ap- of appreciation for state histories yeah I was like man I would love to take like a Texas state history yeah or an Oklahoma state history like just surrounding states Tennessee uh, because of how much those states cross over when you start talking about different right. parts of Arkansas and it's fascinating, man. You don't, I feel like you, there's, <clears throat> when you go through like uh, US 1, you start talking about 13 colonies, you get into a lot of the states, not just like you would if you were doing a state history, but it's like doing an individual, like a deep study on a state is yeah. just different. Yeah. No, I, I completely, completely agree with that. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, Dr. De Black is just, he's incredible man he like is. like just a completely unique delivery and you know it's so like this this uh um this summer he gave some he, he gave a lecture at uh, uh terry because she's a teacher she goes to these professional development things yeah in van buren they hold like this arkansas history where thing. does terry teach at 
Boonville. Okay, okay. Yeah, she teaches yeah, yeah. art at Boonville Elementary. But like uh, uh, in Van Buren at the King Opera House downtown, they had uh, uh, like this convention that was all based around like Arkansas history and stuff like that. And uh, the black was there. Yeah, and he spoke. Wow. And, and, you know, it's like, it's just like in class. You know, I'm like, this is great. I, I saw him at the this, city mall you know? over the uh, summer and uh, just walked up. And I was like, Dr. The black, man, I haven't <laughs> seen you in like years uh because i hadn't i hadn't i hadn't got to run into him very much since i graduated it's yeah. probably been three years since i talked to him yeah and it was awesome he's like if i can help you in any way let me know and i was like thanks i will be in touch yeah. <laughs> it's like the first thing i was like i'm teaching arkansas history yeah, man yeah, yeah. and i was like it's all because of you you know like it just was so inspired yeah. to like because i'd been you know i mean he's one of the authors of the textbook right, so, right. Uh, yeah, i quote yeah. i quoted him in class today uh, about um, I used a quote from him for a test question about yeah. um, political reconstruction. You know, but it's he is man. He does have a super unique delivery. He used to do this thing, uh, this uh, story about the big bar in Arkansas. <laughs> it's like a little play. <laughs> the big bar, <laughs> man. He would he'd always like determine you need to come up here. Okay, you're gonna read this part. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah, read this, yeah. and he'd just act it out, man. And and he's like, you could tell he's done it like a dozen times, and he gets into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, he's he's great, man. Like, uh, not not gonna try to break out a bad to black impression here, but like, like, uh, um, like, yeah, I, I wrote I wrote a, a paper because like we we're supposed to write over like a biography book like every two weeks or something like that, and then we discussed it, right? Mm-hmm. And I it was a book about. Uh, Confederate General Patrick Claiborne. It's called like Stonewall of the West, right? And and I, I wrote about that, and it's and, and we get to class, and and he he takes my paper, and he's he's like kind of like looking it over, and he's like, Mister Storn, you ever been to the battlefield of Franklin before? And I'm like, uh, no. Yeah, hey, you never seen where Patrick Claiborne died? And I'm like, no. And he's like, well, it's the site of a Pizza Hut parking lot now. <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. What was that? Franklin, Tennessee? Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, interesting. Yeah, man, the trans Mississippi theater is super interesting. Right. 750 engagements in the civil war in Arkansas. Yeah. So, um, I mean, many of them minor, but right, a lot of right, guerrilla, right. a lot of guerrilla activity, um, more native Americans engaged on both sides in Arkansas and Missouri than anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they were, they were told they would not have to fight outside of Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, man, uh, I would love to, I need to go by and, uh, meet Dr. Jones. Yeah. Uh, and then to like, there's a few more of the, uh, I would love to have any professor I've ever had that I know <laughs> on my podcast, man. Right. Like, uh, I'm, I just haven't sent his wife a message. Dr. Bush, man. Did you ever have Dr. Bush? Uh, Jeremy no, did. But, Jeremy but had him. Terry, for, Terry has, and she said, yeah, she's told me about him. He's great. He is, yeah. man. I had him for 27 hours of class. Wow. Uh, the guy had a major impact on my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I would love to sit down with him, man. That's the right. cool thing about the podcast. Like, I tell people this, like, how often do you sit, like, and you may, I'd, I'd I don't really, but how often you sit down and just do this? Like, hey, Thurman, how you been? Like, tell me what you've been up to. Yeah, this doesn't happen probably very often, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, I walked out of my, and I'm, dude, I'm just as bad as anybody. I walked out of my office the other day, and there were six students in the hall. Yeah. And they were all just in there. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, everybody's just, like, face down on their phones, and yeah. But, I mean, like... Like I, I'm, I'm an introvert to begin with. So it's like, you know, to me, it's kind of hard. So having an avenue like this to like express and talk ideas and stuff this is great. You know, I mean, this is, it is, uh, you know, this it, is, this is excellent. It, you know? We do something, you know, do something like this. You're so cool. You can do it. Yeah. Like I do it at my desk sometimes. I just record yeah. lectures for, uh, either blackboard or I've done a few history only podcasts, but uh, yeah, I had to learn. Like, I'm not an audio expert at all. Like, you, you, it was very hard for me to, to hook the pedals up in there. You know? <laughs> but uh, like, this is the simple USB mixer. Yeah, I, a lot yeah, of times, yeah. I'll run an audio only feed, but I have a digital audio recorder too. I run on my Mac, but I just got a USB mixer and a headphone amp and hook the computer. Hook the. I mean, figuring out how to do all that wasn't easy. Right. But just hook that camera into the mixer and then <laughs> the amp into the mixer, and it's yeah. It's, it took some figuring out, but. Uh, um, man, now, like, you just, like, like, 
press play and you're good. <laughs> and then right. upload it after the fact. I don't do lives or anything, but man, they, they made it so difficult to do a YouTube live anymore that. Oh, really? Okay. I, I, it, well, first they, they, I, I had to could YouTube live on both my channels and then they took it away and they're like, yeah. well, you don't have enough subscribers is what they're saying. So I was like, oh, what, yeah, whatever. Bogus. But even Joe Rogan stopped live in his podcast because, um, they just keep changing their policies. Yeah. Like, for example, um, if you say the C word mm-hmm. in a podcast, you they will flag that podcast. You can never make money on it. Wow. Like, and it's like, that's just it's like a software program or something like, oh, hey, we scanned your video and we saw that an hour and 38 minutes in, it's C-U-N-T, bro. And yeah. You can't say that. Wow. Well, you can. They're yeah, not going to yeah, bleep right, you right, out. Right. You can, but they, there will be repercussions. Yeah, you which know, right. that's the cyber digital evolution. And like how, if you've noticed, like we're paying, um, Marin used to not have to pay taxes when you order stuff online. A lot of times yes. in Arkansas, now you do. Yeah, right, right. Because like, uh, like I, I think I mentioned that, right, I run like a pedal shop right on reverb i sell guitar pedals and stuff like that yeah. oh no yeah, yeah I, right. I thought you just meant you'd done that in passing and stuff no yeah. no 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 i actually actually kind of like run my own month well it's it's more like i buy a pedal and you know if i'm like okay i've done what i want with it then i'll put it back up you know dude just, yeah, i'll just tell like, you what, like you know pay it forward or whatever what right? i do a lot of is watch videos of people like you buying a pedal and yeah. being like what, this is what it does. Yeah, I'm opening yeah. the box and yeah. plugging it in like this, and it's like here are the settings. Yeah, that's uh, there's um, Sweetwater right does tons of videos like that, and um, all the pedals I bought right. from Boss, I, I watched this dude dem- demo them and different settings, and then I went back and watched it again and took notes and went yeah. in there and dialed them in. Yeah, and, you know, so yeah, that's cool. But yeah, the the reverb thing or whatever, it's like yeah, now you have to pay like sales taxes and stuff on things, and it's just like man, it was so so much easier when it's like okay, yeah, I'll I'll give you fifty dollars for that. And if they just would have Instead taught us like, how to do okay, taxes. I'll give you fifty six forty seven for that. You know, it's like okay, you know, that's just you know, it's it's it, I think it's easier to work in increments like that, especially if you're like trading or you're you know you're you're, you're making deals with people on there because yeah, you have that option you know where you can can try to negotiate a price. Yeah, that's how about that uh, Morello pedal. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, I, was, I think I paid 100 bucks for it. It was, it was used, but it was like mint condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I asked like 130 or something. I was like, 100 <laughs> chip to my door. Right, yeah. You know, I mean, it's so much easier that way. And it, I mean, it, it, it also, it's just economically. It's, it's like, I don't know, you're able to like, rationalize that better or like put it into visualization better. Hey, a hundred dollars, that's a hundred dollar bill, you know, instead of like, well, I've got to pay like 175, 33, you know, it's like, it is, it's a pain, man. Uh, if I, you know, know, for the gym, like I was, I was bragging to Cora earlier cause I signed up a member last night. Okay. So took yeah. the payment and everything. I haven't taken a payment from a member in probably like three years. <clears throat> so it's like a big deal. She's like, I can't <laughs> believe you accepted a cur- currency. Yeah. You yeah, tapped yeah. the card in, you did it. And I was just like, yeah, it's because like when we first like went, um, we switched our billing software at some point. I just like yeah. removed myself from it for the reasons you're talking about, though. It's like, like I was just like in my mind, I'm like, look, we have an accountant and he talks about and does things for me. I don't, I can't, I'm never going to, yeah, 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 I'm right. never going to, I'm just like, I'm not willing to, it's a weakness. I'm not willing to take time to learn it. And, um, so I just kind of like forgot how to do a lot of stuff conveniently, but man, sales tax, use tax, yeah, those yeah, types yeah, of yeah, things. Yeah. And then knowing, um, what's a write off and what's not, what's a percentage write off and what's not. It's like, man, I didn't get any of that K 12. I didn't get any of that in econ. Right. I didn't get any of that in any of the policy right. classes I took. Mr. Hart civics class taught me how to write a check, but man, now I pay with my phone for everything. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Like, I, you, you use Apple, you have an iPhone? Yeah, I have an you, iPhone. You, you use Apple Pay? No. <laughs> so, not No, every, I have I've resisted that. Not dude. everybody accepts it, but, dude, it's like 10 times faster okay, than a so, card. Okay, so you're saying it's recommended, then? Is that, is that, I would, is that what you I would recommend it. If you have some paranoia about it, you know. Because I didn't even know, like, I had my Apple wallet in here, and I kept seeing, like, my card. I'm like... Like when I pull it up, I didn't even know I had the option. I'm yeah. Like, like my card's on here. Like somebody is, uh, is trying to hack into my phone. Right. Like that was my first, like, what? I, I didn't mean to do that. Like, why yeah, am I? Yeah. And then I realized that's, it, I'd punch my card number in and then I could just go dink. Right. And, and you know how like a card processes and prints the receipt? None of that. Yeah. 
It's just like you're done. See ya. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've I've never or I haven't gotten on board with Apple Pay yet. I don't know. Some of that my 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 dad is pretty anti technology. Like I mean, to the point of like comedy, right? I mean, he doesn't have a debit card. Like oh wow. Like yeah, all he'll carry is like like a certain set number. Like like it's like twenty dollars and some odd cents or whatever. Like it's like that's all you need, right? You know, and it's like what you know. I mean, like on his person or whatever. Yeah. But it, and it's like it's like it took him up until maybe about four years ago to get a phone, or maybe maybe more like three years ago to 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 get to get a cell phone, right? And and it's it's just a common flip phone, right? That you put minutes on and everything like that. And he calls it his burner, you know, like like you can just like you know, yeah, he's. Like, yeah <laughs> you know? dude I, that's the first time i met your dad i've been yeah. around your mom yeah, uh, yeah, yeah which your mom works at uh the junior high yeah, yeah she, i think she's hey, maybe this year or maybe next year but she's gonna retire okay so, wow but yeah so like well i just i'd seen her and been around her uh, uh, yeah yeah I, but I'd, I'd never met royal yeah royal royal story what royal. a great name y-e-l-l yeah. what did do you have so what's your name it's tl story what's your middle name lee lee yeah no, that's my middle name too yeah yeah um, i mean it's the most common middle name in the world lee is really the most is. common middle name in the world but it's like right i was given the name thurman which is highly uncommon you know <laughs> you're the only thurman i've ever right, met yeah for yeah. sure but i i mean like uh and where did that name come from uh i my my dad named me after thurman munson who was a catcher for the new york yankees Back in the 1970s, he was the captain of the team, died in a plane crash in 1979, but he was my dad's favorite player. So that's where I got the name Thurman from. Wow. Which, as name, which, uh, the story is, is that the middle name, it became Thurman Lee story because my dad's like, hey, like, because my mom is Anna Lee, right? Yeah, why don't, why don't we just, just make Thurman's middle name Lee then? But Thurman Munson's full name is Thurman Lee Munson. So, okay. <laughs> I think win, he, win. he may have like slipped that in, you know, like, like, like there, but you know, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool. I've, I've, I mean, I know like. Like it, it's, it was probably weird being like five, six years old and having a name like that, you know, cause you got, you're surrounded by plenty of Josh's or, you know, just like common, common names. Right. And it's just like Thurman. And it's like, you're just like a little short five-year-old kid, you know, <laughs> present. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, yeah. And it's, but no, I mean, it's, 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 it's great. Like I, I, I don't have any issues with it. But I like going by by TL just because it's like, hey, that's an author name. You know? It's oh, like, yeah. Like no, T.S. Sure. Elliot, you know? <laughs> for sure. I, I don't even know where the TL came from. Is that your Facebook name or something? How, I don't um, even know how I knew that. Well, I mean, I've got my name as Thurman Lee Storing, but I, I, I think I used to just use that uh, I used to when, when I would do like the poetry stuff at like the coffee house and all that. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh man, those are the yeah. Days. Those were, we that, haven't that even was, talked about. No, we we haven't talked about that because that was that was back when uh, uh, me and like like Josh Wilson. He's been on the podcast. Yeah, twice. yeah. yeah or, or, that's when he was going under the name Rip Wilson at that time. I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, he was Rip Wilson, and right, I was I was TL storing. That was that was, <laughs> but yeah, we used to do the poetry thing quite a lot, and that was that was a lot of fun. And some of it's not bad. I actually revisited some of it, and I was like, hey, some of this is not bad. And then it's like you run across, and you're like, this is terrible. You know, this is terrible high school poetry. You know, it's like, <laughs> man. <laughs> You know, I've thought about that several times, like over the years, like, but as you grow older, like you write things that are more relevant, they have deeper yeah, meaning yeah, because yeah. of your experience, but, but also like I, um, wouldn't create things or would be, uh, second guessy about things I create right. because it's like, Oh, well, you know, who am I or whatever. But yeah. like to have that raw, uh, experience conveyed, of, of an 18 year old of a 17 year old of yeah. like uh, the, it, it can be done right you know right, they can yeah. have a short a story to sh- share because some people will just discount uh, people because of age and because uh, that came up like that in not to get into all that but the Greta Thunberg stuff so, yeah yeah and, with the, and I was kind of on that camp I was like yeah. come talk to us when you can vote <laughs> like that's <laughs> that's how I was like I was like we decided yeah. as a society not to give you political rights yeah and that was it that that was it for me but like so many people but but at the same time it's like all of that aside like she had tons of great points and right. we shouldn't discount her because of her age, but is a society we do. So it's a weird dichotomy there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I agree with that sentiment. <laughs> yeah. So, but, um, 
Well, right on, man. Well, you know, hopefully uh, we could sit down and do this again sometime. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are plenty of. Yeah, I mean the, I know mean, uh, the baby's on the way of. Course, yeah, but, yeah. You get on the other but side. No, of that no, no. I mean this, this, this is this has been great. This has been fun. Uh, honestly, yeah, it's not very often that I get to you know just. <laughs> wax academic you yeah know, about no dad things, this has been know? a stimulating conversation right man. You know, uh, so this... it's you know and i mean just just about just random things not you know not just ac- academia but just like you know just just some random topics and and things like that and and i mean like like there's you know there's a lot of projects and things that that yeah i'm gonna be working with. i mean doing the music thing of course and uh uh one thing uh, this is back in the academic thing that i've kind of wanted to get into is retail history Ooh, because, wow. and, and this is kind of kind of refreshment because you, you talked about meeting to black at the city mall right yeah are you aware of the dead <clears throat> mall phenomena uh yeah i'm charting it uh, how many malls have closed in the united yeah. states well, also uh, like businesses like for example in that city mall you know there's like only like 400 quiznos left open in the united states i didn't know that yeah like yeah. you look at chain restaurants like that. dude like we wouldn't be going to hastings all the time if they right. still didn't have one but they don't because it's dead yeah yeah, yeah, right. and, and well, but that's it. Like retail stores, yeah, are closing, and right. it's because of Jeff Bezos. I saw his, I saw his yacht, in Pensacola, <laughs> and it's very big. Yeah, yeah, but right. Like, like the <clears throat> the the dead mall phenomenon and all. I mean, it's it's really intriguing. Like, like, like retail history, and and it's twentieth century thing, right? I mean, it's like a twentieth well, century consumerism, the American. development of a right. mass consumer culture. Right. I remember when we uh, was it Gilded Age when that yes, starts really coming right, about, right? Yeah, which I mean that that to me is like a fascinating topic because it's like right i think maybe people from i say our generation i mean folks in their 30s remember like malls were like the epicenters of culture man you know that's like that was like the point dude i went to best buy this is how much we deteriorated from what you're talking i went to best buy yesterday and got cora uh the some ear pods yeah uh wireless headphones or whatever yeah yeah tried to call them because they were out on stock online everywhere but it's like oh, we have some at the Conway store but I still wasn't clear if I had to order them through Best Buy and they would ship them there yeah they couldn't get a hold of anybody on the phone they were open they'd been open 30 minutes like, tried driving there just nobody walk in and like 13 people working like it takes me a long time to get help uh, I finally do get help and I'm like hey I need to buy these two things and he's like because they were just like the hangy things right and he's like yeah um you which ones <laughs> i was like well they were hanging on the one the, the base model or whatever just the 144 or whatever yeah and he's like it doesn't say that on here <laughs> and i was like well he's hanging in that spot man yeah, i don't what, know what the heck yeah and, and he's like <laughs> he's like so you want to buy them <laughs> and i was like no i was like no. dude i want to buy two yeah. pair like i brought you two <laughs> and he was just like yeah it's gonna be a minute and i was just like dude i'm never coming here again like i'm only buying online but it's like you were saying with guitars and stuff it's like you can't universally buy shit online Mm -hmm. like uh my buddy colby plays his uh congos bongos and shit in there he um he really wants one of those hand pans you see it looks like a tortoise shell Mm -hmm. but he's super like this is like a thousand dollar purchase yeah yeah and he's super paranoid about it because it's like yeah let's just pay a thousand dollars and those throw it in the mail yeah and yeah from, from out of country right and uh maybe it'll still be in tune when it gets <laughs> or maybe i could tune it oh wait i don't even know how to use this thing because it's a new instrument yeah i mean it's just I, I like like yeah this is something i I've, like the dead mall phenomena or whatever is something that i've like kept track of for probably the past 15 years like like i mean even back when i was like in high school like i noticed i'm like hey man these malls are dropping off you know there used to be one in little rock it was called university mall that's now long gone they demolished it there's another one in fort smith besides central mall that was called phoenix village mall i didn't know about that yeah it was the first uh, enclosed mall in the state of arkansas it opened in 1970 it's now where the uh, sykes call center is yeah <laughs> But I'm like going to, I'm going to Fort Smith. Uh, yeah, like this but, weekend, this Friday. Yeah, but like, uh, like I mean, like, like these places, like, like uh, University. I mean, yeah, it was dead or, or Phoenix Phoenix Village closed like in 06 and they didn't remodel it till like 2010. But it just sat there and was just like decaying, just like falling apart. You know, just the, you know the, the the windows busted out. You know, that's it, it's it's just a weird, surreal kind of like urban exploration type thing, right? But like the right the the sort of collapse of uh, yeah consumer culture and sort of this that's, this yeah. like 
in the uh, and it's it's sort of like what what you're talking about, like with your your experience with customer service or whatever, and how how like differently like geared customer service was like in the '60s versus what it is today. Like, I mean, when you went to a department store, it wasn't. I mean, it was like an experience. Like, I mean, they had like restaurants in department stores. I mean, you get your hair done, you can get photos taken, you know, all yeah. this kind of stuff, right? But the idea of the indoor mall was like this futuristic like utopian type vision right well now it's kind of like it's weird it's weird we've come back around to like the strip mall type approach yeah. like when i go when i travel i see more of that right than anything yeah uh, like what you have uh, the rough example of what you have around conway from exit 127 to 128 or 129 you have that hole from like where best buy is all the way to where like ross and yeah yeah the back over the new off the dave ward where they put in um but uh, where's that Pinnacle Hills? Yeah, here in, here right. In the, the Promenade. Yeah, that's that's up in Springdale, right? Is it Springdale? I can't remember. It's on. I, I've only been there a few times. Maybe Rogers. Maybe. Okay. Rogers. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, it's up in the Greater Northwest Arkansas. Yes. Area. Yes. It's yeah, uh, well, man. It's. Uh, Honestly, like you'll be in Bentonville, then you'll cross over the overpass, you'll be in Rogers, but you'll go down this way, still be on that side of the overpass, you're in Bentonville, and Springdale's over here, but sometimes... It, yeah. Because like, Corey and I go up to North Arkansas a lot because of uh, we uh, one of our coaches owns like f- uh, four martial arts academies up there. Yeah. So, um, and all, all of those cities we're mentioning, and yeah. Rogers, and Bentonville, Fayetteville, and Springdale, so, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, um... Wow, I mean, that's, uh, but yeah, the, most recently, and I mean, you can go onto YouTube and you can just find videos where people are exploring these these dead malls, these places that are like stuck. I mean, they're like aesthetic, like time capsules for like a completely different era. You Do you know? think that's like a subset of like any other branch of history, like labor or economic yeah, history? Yeah, see, I mean, like, I don't know exactly where that fits in because I mean, yeah, you could probably consider it economic history, but there's also like a cultural aspect to it yeah yeah for sure dr gleason uh, i had her for several classes she taught um labor history yeah and that was something that i was reviewing my u.s history one notes i had her for that but she's always interjecting labor back into there and when i took her for gilded age and um some other class i took her for that was like i was like 19 14 and 1945 perhaps okay that's another class i took her for uh but that's like when that development of that mass consumer culture is coming along yeah, but yeah, yeah. also major things in labor are starting to happen right and like you know that I'm, I'm looking forward to u.s history too so i'm gonna try and put all that back in yeah. next fall i should be teaching u.s history too so yeah be uh everything i've developed all my other courses the last one on the horizon so <laughs> cool yeah well right on man well let's wrap it up dude okay. that way uh that's, you know that's cool i don't i don't actually know how long we've been talking uh what's what, it probably three, like three two, hours, two? two and a half ish okay well, something like that hopefully it wasn't boring for you no no I not at all tell I mean, people I, mean, if, I appreciate your time if I, uh, uh if you'll have me back i i will be back um i guess i should issue a challenge to jeremy barlow and say you need <clears throat> you need to get on here with me man yeah <laughs> yeah dude it's been so cool like I'm, i knew i met jeremy when i was eight years old at church and yeah. um hung out with him stayed night at his house when we were growing up and stuff one time he taped last of the mohicans off a tv for me on his vcr because my vcr was broken thanks jeremy <laughs> um but yeah great dude and i know you two dudes are yeah, I mean, close friends right. and it, I think it'd be cool to just get you two time. dudes in the same room yeah. so uh, and just be a fly on the wall yeah <laughs> right but uh, well, yeah we'll definitely have to get together man and uh, congrats on your thesis oh, okay. uh, yeah. congrats on the uh, yeah upcoming the, yeah, childbirth look, actually yeah looking forward to it I'm not I'm not uh, okay uh, yeah I will admit yeah it's a bit scary. document every it's experience in, dude because right, I'm right. Uh, in planning phase okay like, well, Core cool. and I are planning yeah. uh, probably about another year before we uh Within the next year, we're going to... Like, we're not not trying yeah, if it yeah. happened, whatever. Yeah, you know, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, Chorus is like, uh, over the, in one year, it will. Like, that's when we're at form. If we're able to conceive yeah, in yeah, one year, right. that's the the window she is... Well, yeah, I mean, like, I, I know uh, Luna's not technically here yet, but I mean, like, I, I technically... I, I mean, like, I, I completely recommend it. You know, it's... I mean, even, like, like... I, like I said, even though she's not here, it's like, like, being able to, like, see her, like, little hands or feet like move around 
like it. It's so weird, but it's 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 so cool too. You know. Yeah. Like, I, here's one thing I want to yeah, ask you about. In there, you know? After <laughs> after that is every dad I've talked. I've talked to a lot of dads about yeah. this. It's like, hey, like, what am I gonna do? Like, it's not the same as my dog. Like, <laughs> um, but <laughs> try and chart the shift you have in consciousness. The yeah. first time you lay eyes on your child. Yeah. That's something all parents have reported to me. Yeah, I've heard this too. That and, it's, and it's like, just like, you just don't know until you see yeah. it. Like, you're like, that's... Yeah, and everybody it's, it's has like a love like, like uh, no other... Or what, yeah, I've heard this like like ad nauseum, you know? <laughs> well, and I can only oh, yeah, describe yeah, it as I a mean, shift, a literal right. shift in consciousness. Yeah. A, a moment in which you change forever. Right. Uh, it, so I'm fascinated by that. Yeah, I am too. And because, uh, yeah, I technically standing on threshold of that so uh maybe I'll, I'll be able maybe the next time i come here i'll be a completely different person you know it's <laughs> probably not but you know you know <laughs> more more refined yeah i mean I, is that even possible yeah no no i'm, I'm kidding no i've always dressed like this well not always but for the past it's like, a great suit man well thank you, you. you even in the college avenue uh, coffee house days you yeah were, i well i was trying to evoke the the 70s kind of with this so you know it, right. it fit kind of with the conspiracy stuff so yeah Definitely going to the water. Kind of like a spook later. a little bit. Yeah, maybe, right. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna go hang out with G. Gordon Liddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, that would be a great, uh, great topic. For, uh, the Cuban immigrants, uh, the refugees, yeah. being in, the guys that got caught breaking in, like f- um, five of them. Or the, the burglars were Cuban. Yeah. <laughs> we'll keep using you guys one more and right, we're going to go get Fidel. Right. It's the agency, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. like they, they've got a roster, you know? And it's like, they just, okay, well, we'll have them do this. Say, e. Howard Hunt. All right. We'll send him in. You know, it's like. <laughs> Roger Stone. That was that guy yeah, I was trying yeah, to mention. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you said E. Howard Hunt, and I don't know why that jogged my memory. Well, but, yeah. yeah, E. Howard Hunt, CIA connections, like yeah. oil, all this. Yeah, oil. You know, that's yeah, wait, wait, military industrial complex, right? You got to get back to that. Everybody's in on it. <laughs> yeah. The aliens even are in on it. Rep- you know, what, shape-shifting reptilian yeah, right. lizard people I, 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 named Mark what's, Zuckerberg. What's the name of that guy who does? Dave, David Icke? Da- yeah, is it that, is. Is that the name of that guy? I-C-K, he's something on like BBC and yeah. uh, Vice and stuff. Yeah, right. The guy's everywhere or, he, or he, what's, what's scary is he has that thesis and he does have coherent shit like yeah, and uh, he, and he, yeah yeah i forget what he was talking coherently about something to do with uh, like the global economy or something and i was just like well so. i mean right there, there does have to be some semblance of truth right to it there has to be something but then it's like well you layer on the, i think some know. of this might be like atheism like yeah, atheists are like yeah we don't have an explanation so we call it the spaghetti monster yeah right <laughs> <laughs> like your spaghetti monster like uh, that's what that's how they describe god yeah right or, or their deity yeah. or whatever the, the flying spaghetti flying monster. spaghetti monster yeah yeah that was that was like an internet thing right was well yeah thing? uh in like alaska or somewhere there's uh they pray at city meetings which they do here in russellville too and so like this guy started showing up like i want to give the invocation of the prayer and he prays to the flying spaghetti monster wow america <laughs> ah, yeah well <laughs> quite crazy but yeah that that's something that's going to be i think elevating more but gives us plenty to talk about right absolutely yeah. all right man well we're signing off uh we'll see you soon man all Appreciate right you. yeah see you later <laughs> well that was good